Our story begins with a long sword that rushes forward at great speed. A rider in Red Knight's armor cuts off the young man's right arm. The one in horror looks in front of him does not understand what is happening. Someone shouts Chris at him. Chris wakes up startled, sweat running down his face. The guy next to him asks why Chris is tossing and turning again, and Chris sighs and answers Lois. Chris rides the cart with Lois, the coachman who manages the horses, laughing, and then Chris says that he can't get used to these dreams. The driver is a guy with a scar and he smiles, and then asks if he was dreaming, how his hands fall off, or whether these words made Chris and Lois stand in a stupor. Chris bared his teeth in displeasure, says that the coachman did not meddle in his own business, just drove the cart. The coachman replied that he hears this from the defender who is sleeping at work, Chris replied that he should look at himself, green man. And then Chris, sitting in the cart, continues to say that where is there a guy so beaten up that he will start a fight with a mercenary in order to rob such a merchant. Chris looks at Lois with a smile, then asks if he's right, and Lois smiles thoughtfully. Suddenly, the cart is surrounded by bandits Lois and Chris are looking at them carefully, and the bandit, smiling, continues to tell them to pull out all the goods. Chris laughs and replies that it looks like there was one. Suddenly the coachman comes up to the bandit and gives him a high five with the palm of his hand. The bandit says that great job Chris watching this thinks that really here the guy was a spy. Chris, frowning, stares away and then asks the merchant how this could have happened. The merchant puts his hands out in front of him in fright and says that they did not know anything themselves. They checked at the time of hiring if they had a mercenary card with them. The guy who drove the cart smiles and then pulls back his cape and shows the chevron of a mercenary he smiles and says that's right, he's a mercenary don't let them get so upset. Chris looks at Lois carefully and then thinks that the situation has become more complicated. Suddenly, Lois is staring at the bandits with his sword ready and starts saying that he is a mercenary named Lois. If they retreat, they will get a good reward, he swears by his name. One of the bandits looks ahead in confusion and asks Lois, the mercenary who drove the cart with closed eyes answers that it is exactly the same Lois. He looks at Lois and wonders if Lois's words have convinced them. The mercenary and the bandits laughed, and then the mercenary in a fit of laughter said that this is the same Lois Scorostral, the same disabled person who lasts only three minutes. Chris, looking unfriendly at the bandits, thought that they underestimated him, in fact, not three, but five. The bandits continued to laugh out loud. Lois got very angry and started to pull out his sword. Chris grabbed him by the shoulder and said in a serious voice that he should cool down, he would deal with it himself. Chris looked ahead with a sad look, and he wondered if he knew Lois was certainly good with a sword. He, looking at the menacing looks of the bandits, continued to think that, however, it would not come to that. The merchant, looking fearfully at the bandits, asked what they needed, and one of the bandits menacingly replied that I don't even know. It was a dark-skinned bandit, his eyes were intimidating, and he glared at the merchant and said that he thought whoever had it knew. Chris looked back at the merchant. He stared at him, and the man looked nervous, and Chris wondered if they were hiding something. Chris, looking at the frightened merchant and the nearby bandits, began to calmly say that why don't they just disperse like ships at sea, let them choose the easy way, besides, what can be more important than their own lives. Chris stared at the bandits and thought that he knew this from experience. And then Chris furrowed his brows and looked ahead, and then said menacingly, hurry up, they can't wait any longer. Chris started to say something in a whisper. The leader of the bandits looked at them with a mad smile, and then Chris thought that it seemed that these assholes were not going to leave them alone. Chris whispered for them to run away. The merchant and his companion looked at Chris fearfully, not knowing what to do. Lois stared off to the side. Chris glared at Loisa while the bandits were relaxed. Chris began to draw his sword from its scabbard and told the merchant and his servant to run now. The merchant and his servants began to run in different directions, and Chris turned around and immediately threw the blade at the bandits. The mercenary who was driving the carriage blocked Chris' blade with difficulty. Chris immediately did a sideways somersault. Lois literally cut down a couple of bandits who were standing not far from him in a couple of blows. And then the head of the bandits began to come at them menacingly, shouting that they were scum. Chris turned to Lois and shouted maybe that they should split up. The head of the bandits shouted insanely loudly for them all to be caught. Chris started to run away from the wagon, followed by the bandits and the mercenary. Suddenly, while running away, Chris turned around. He saw the menacing eyes of the bandits' heads. He ran head first with you. Bandits were running in his wake. Chris has many professions, a mercenary, a guide who guides travelers through dangerous places, a treasure hunter who searches the maps for something that has long been lost, a witch doctor who collects dangerous herbs, and even a chef who skillfully prepares different dishes. Chris ran through the forest from bandits and a mercenary trying to survive with one hand. He threw the hook to the side that caught on the tree, exerting great effort. The bandit ran after him with a smile and shouted that he would catch him. The mercenary shouted loudly for Chris to stop alive. Chris examined the small blade and rope carefully, then wondered if they thought he would let himself be caught so easily. The rope with the blade was firmly anchored in the bark of the tree. Chris did a little somersault forward, 
dodging the line he just pulled. The bandit who was trying his best to catch up to him didn't notice her and his head was chopped off. The bandit's head quickly bounced to the side. Chris thought with a smile that they were stupid. The bandit and the mercenary glared at Chris and Chris wondered if he was going to have to run again. After a while, the bandit was lying on the ground with several small spikes stuck in his head and a mercenary was standing nearby, choking on a cloud of poisonous smoke. He glared ahead. Then he vomited blood and started to fall to the ground. Chris watched, startled. He sighed heavily, then said that he didn't have anything left to use. Chris was cornered. There was only a cliff leading to the river behind him. He said that if he was cornered further, he would have to go swimming. Thank God it was over. Chris approached the body of the mercenary, who was lying in his black blood. He said that for some reason he could not see their leader. Could it be that he ran in a different direction? Suddenly Chris was startled, remembering Loisa, asking if he was all right. And then Chris was very scared when he heard the leader's words. He asked in a sad voice that everyone was dead. The ringleader was making his way through the poisonous smoke with a mad smile on his face. He carefully examined Chris and then said that he saw that Chris could wield poisons. Chris, looking fearfully at the bandit leader, replied that yes and then wondered what kind of Makar the head remained unharmed. Chris stared intently at the frightening bandit leader, then wondered why the hell this monster was bothering a simple merchant passing through the city. Suddenly, the leader of the bandits threw a head towards Chris, who was sitting on the ground. Chris looked in the direction of the bandits with a puzzled expression and went on to say that Chris' friend had caused him a bit of a sweat. Chris watched in fright as two severed heads of Lois and the merchant appeared in front of him. The head of the bandits said that even if it was fast, Lois fought well. The head of the bandits pointed at himself and asked if Chris knew what it was, a frightened Chris asked what, then thought that he needed to strain his brain, if even Lois couldn't handle him, then he needed to figure out how to get away from this psycho. The head of the bandits got a small bag under the t-shirts, and then with a crazy smile answered that it was an artifact, Chris asked the artifact again in fright. The bandit head continued to say that it was a treasure that could turn an item into a weapon, armor, or just a block of stone. He had heard that with the money from selling such a thing, one could live for as long as three generations. Chris, looking at the head of the bandits, replied that this is the point. He leaned on his one hand and continued to say that he had heard that if you contact an artifact, you can die a painful death, so it was true. And then, with a frown, he added that the bandit head should spare him, to which the answer was no. The bandit leader started to approach, saying that he was in a good mood today, However, so he would try to finish Chris off quickly and he was also grateful that he had dealt with those assholes instead of him. Chris stared in front of him, startled, and then wondered what the difference was, he was going to kill him anyway. The leader of the bandits approached and raised his hand to Chris and said goodbye. Chris stared ahead, startled. Suddenly, small shards of glass flew into the bandit's eyes. Chris shoved them out of his mouth at the baffled bandit chief. As he blew them out, it occurred to him that he was apologizing, but he wasn't just going to die. Chris stared ahead, startled, as red lightning flashed around him. The head of the bandits took off, surrounded by red lightning. He swung his sword fiercely and chopped off Chris' single arm at high speed, causing him to yell in pain. The bandit's right eye filled with blood and glared menacingly in front of him. Chris started to fall. He bumped into the bandit leader's waist. The bandit on the rock took Chris by the hair in his teeth, then said he didn't think he'd be able to finish him off painlessly. And then the bandits threw Chris into the ground with great force and Chris rolled face first on the ground. Chris lay in the garden opposite his severed hand, and then that bandits. The bandits, examining their reddened eyes heard Chris start laughing as he turned around. Chris, lying on the edge of the cliff, continued to laugh. The head of the bandits looked menacingly at the exhausted Chris and asked what he had, if the roof had gone. Chris, hanging from the cliff, held the artifact bag in his mouth and continued to laugh. The bandits' frightened head started checking their pockets, not understanding where the artifact was. It suddenly dawned on him. He turned to Chris and said it couldn't be. Chris replied with a smile on his face. Then he jumped off a cliff and into a raging mountain river. The bandit's head jumped after him, trying to reach Chris. Chris looked at the bandit with a smile and thought that his throat was torn open by glass, that he spat at him, that the guy even cut off his last arm. Chris continued to stare at the bandit's tea-colored face, and then thought that, however, looking at his expression, he thinks his efforts were not in vain at all, so he is calm, he looks at him as if he has lost an entire country. Both of them fell into the river with a huge splash. Chris started to sink to the bottom, thinking that he had heard that if a non-activated artifact got dirty, it might cause it to malfunction. Chris grinned as he sank to the bottom, he laughed, and then wondered if there was so much shit inside of him, let it get dirty. Chris, sinking to the bottom, began to gradually close his eyes, thinking that this is how the life of 39-year-old Chris ends. Suddenly, he heard a voice inside him, a search for power, a desire for knowledge, a fervent desire, looking at the approaching head of the bandits, he wondered what. The leader of the bandits glared at Chris and continued to swim towards him, while an unfamiliar voice spoke in Chris's head, fervor and concentration, incompetent persistence. 
The bandit leader's hand was approaching Chris' face, then Chris heard a voice in his head coming back. Chris suddenly woke up. He looked around, puzzled, and then asked what. He looked down. He saw a young reflection of himself and his right hand. Standing in the middle of the battle, he thought that he understood again that dream in which he was on the battlefield for the first and last time. Someone shouted from the side to block the cavalrymen. Behind the puzzled Chris, a knight was running, shouting stop them. Chris wondered why he had suffered so much. But even after death, he was back in this dream. But for a dream, his feelings are too realistic. The cavalrymen were running forward in a huge formation, and Chris wondered if they were advancing, the same cavalryman who had taken his hand away. The cavalryman was closing in menacingly on Chris, and Chris reflected that he had always wanted to dodge his attack, but even in his sleep, he was in a stupor and he never managed to avoid the blow. The cavalryman swung his sword at Chris, and Chris wondered if it would end the same way this time. Chris squeezed his hand and thought that it would hurt, he would feel the pain, just like in reality. The cavalryman's sword was rushing at a great speed, Chris wondered what he was begging for. He closed his eyes and didn't move, hoping it would turn out to be a dream. The cavalryman swung his sword, but Chris crouched down and dodged the blow. He stared in front of him with his hands on his head, puzzled, not understanding what was happening. The trooper stopped, and Chris wondered if he'd dodged. And then the trooper was shot through the head with an arrow, and Chris was on his knees, asking if it was really true. Suddenly, a system message appeared in front of Chris, saying that Chris had earned experience points. Chris wondered what else it was. Chris touched his face, puzzled, and the message started when he asked if it was a dream. We are transported to the moment when someone squeezes someone's cheek. The tent is full of young warriors who are busy with various things. Chris is standing in front of his companion, who looks at him with a puzzled expression and asks what is wrong with him. Chris grabs the boy's pike and says that he really is Lind, but Lind doesn't care and says that things are bad, it looks like Chris hit his head on something. They grab Lind by the shoulders and smile at him, and then he thinks that it can't be. He pulls back his pant leg and sees a bloody wound, Lind says it hurts. Chris looks at the small cut, and then Lind says that his cut burns so much, whether it will get worse, Chris replies that so far it seems fine. Chris wonders if in a previous life, Linda didn't heal such a small wound, and as a result, he lost his leg. Looking at the wound, Linda Chris thought about it. He imagined them drinking beer together in adulthood, and in this life, both he and Linda would have all their body parts left in place. Chris looked menacingly ahead and thought that he wouldn't let that horror happen to them again. But Lind suddenly shouted loudly that he was in pain. Chris was carefully bandaging Linda's leg. He carefully looked at the wound as he tied a knot, and then said that thank god there was white grass near the barracks, but to heal the wound completely, you need other herbs. He remembered how his mentor had told him that if there were enough herbs, the most important thing was to give first aid quickly, Chris thought, this was the first thing his mentor healer had taught him. Chris bandaged Lind's leg and said that everything was ready, Lind looked at his leg with a smile and said that Chris was a jack of all trades. He looked ahead with a smile and then added, thank you Chris, Chris thought not. He remembered that before that, in a previous life, Lind had bandaged his hand, with tears in his eyes, when Chris was sitting unconscious, there were bloody bandages everywhere, Chris thought that Lind had done much more for him when he lost his Russian language, incompetent. Chris, looking at Lind's leg, wondered what he still owed him, and then said that he was tired. Suddenly a soldier came into the room, carrying a piece of paper. Everyone in the tent immediately turned to look at him, and the soldier said attention. The soldier began to read the letter carefully, saying that according to the commander's instructions, their teenage squad would now become the reserve of the 7th Infantry Squad. The old man listened intently as he sharpened his axe, a soldier sat next to him picking his nose, and the soldier continued to say that they would start attending training, but they would not be officially registered in the infantry. Suddenly, the soldier added something else and called the big guy, the guy loudly shouted yes, and the soldier continued to say that now he is the commander of this barracks, temporarily and that's all for him. The guy picking his nose with a smile said they wouldn't be listed, that's interesting. Chris, looking at them, wondered if they were still as green as he thought they were. Chris, looking at the soldier, thought that it seemed to him that he just haughtily said that from now on, the task will be collecting arrows. He put his hand to his chin, and then continued to think that there were 10 days left until the next fight, during which time there was a lot to deal with. Chris called out to Lind, but Lind was already asleep. Looking at the sleeping man, Linda Chris adjusted the blanket for him and thought that because he was injured, at least no one would disturb him and let him rest. Chris turned around and thought that he should sort out his own business, too. We are being transported to the Zaytara's forest. The fighters are walking through the forest, and someone asks them in a puzzled way why they were shoved into a group of hunters. Ahead of them is a middle-aged fighter with red long hair, who turns to his friend and asks why these youngsters are with them. His friend pulls out a package and tells him to light one, and there's a guy named Chris behind him, he's just something. 
A guy with a little stubble on his face and short hair remembered Chris saying if he needs more, let them call him, gave him two rolls of paper, he gave him cigarettes and asked him to join them. The guy with the stubble looked at his friend with red hair and asked that how such a kid could make such cigarettes, he's just a talent, even if he doesn't worry in general. Chris and his younger companions were walking through the forest, looking around anxiously, and in front of them an adult boy began to say that he had heard that in his village they called him Hunter Chris. The guy with short hair asked his friend if he would have a cigarette or not, his friend with red hair said that he would refuse, the guy replied that they were almost there. Suddenly they stopped. A guy with short hair shouted loudly that everyone should catch five birds with one stone. Chris was looking around thoughtfully when the guy continued to shout, if they went deep into the forest, they might run into a group of cobbles, so let them be on their guard and that's all. Chris thought that five hairs is like two fingers on the asphalt, he will put hairs on the back burner. Chris, looking at the forest, thought that he would first try to get as much as possible that could be useful. He plucked a small red petal from the thick one, and then said the grass that is the foundation of the foundations. He glared at it angrily, it was on his collar and in a small backpack, and then he said that he couldn't help but pack it up. All of a sudden, Chris slapped his cheek with his hand, a message popped up in his head that he had earned experience points. Chris, looking at his hand, said that damn, he almost peed in his pants. There was a small graze on his cheek and he shouted that why were the artifacts making so much noise. Standing under the tree, Rhys sighed and asked what kind of thing it was. Chris scratched behind his ear, and then said that first she brought him back to the past, and now she was yelling in his ears, of course, he knew that artifacts are not simple things, but so much so. Chris remembered the bandit leader holding his head, and then he wondered what the bastard knew that he was so desperate to take the artifacts away from him. Okay, now wasn't the time to think about that. Chris looked away, puzzled, and wondered if he would gradually learn the abilities of this artifact. Suddenly, a small bee flew past him and he looked at it and said that he should start with it. Chris paused, watching the bee get caught in the web. Looking at her, he said it was beautiful. A bee buzzed in the web, trying to get out, and Chris said it was luck. All of a sudden, a small spider named Chris asked, it's a honey ant, crawled out of the web. He grabbed him by the head, and then said that he was very famous, he couldn't find him for so long, then suddenly found him. Chris sat in the tree with a smile, snapped his bag shut, and then said that it was still good that he came here. He licked his lips as he looked at the spider web where the bee was stuck, and then said that if he could get honey, too. Chris jumped away from the tree, breaking the web, then added that it would be awesome. He jumped nimbly to the ground, bits of cobwebs falling down. A bee, its stinger outstretched, flew in front of Chris in a puzzled manner. Then she charged forward at high speed, rushing quickly past Chris. It was flying at a high speed, and there were still bits of cobwebs hanging from it. Chris was running fast behind her. He had been running for so long that he was already getting tired. Suddenly the bee made a couple of turns and flew into a tree. Chris with a smile looking up saw a hive, near which bees were circling he happily said that he had found his medic. We are taken to a soldier who stands in front of the head of the squad and says that they can definitely just sit here. They haven't caught a single hair, the head of the squad replied that he knows that only Chris is a hunter, they need to believe in him. Suddenly, someone from behind, the squad leader, continued to say that the sun would soon set. Suddenly, someone shouted you incompetence, the guy together with the head was very scared. Behind them was an older man with short hair who glared at them menacingly, then shouted that he was watching, they had time to chat, the guy with red hair standing behind him said that they were having a good time. A guy with short hair glared at his subordinates standing near the river, shouted that they must have already met the norm, Chris was walking behind them, and then asked what was going on here. Chris walked past the guy with the long red hair, taking the hairs with him. The guy with the red hair bent down, looking at the large number of rabbit carcasses, and then asked in a puzzled way, did Chris catch all this himself? This is not bad. Chris looked at him with a smile, pointed at himself, and then said that there was no one in his village who didn't know him, Hunter Chris. The guy with the long hair looked at the hairs with interest, and then said that although Chris tried to catch them because of his friends, it was all in vain. Chris looked indignantly at the guy, and then asked what, there were two puzzled companions standing behind him, and the guy with long hair said that this was not enough, Chris indignantly replied that he was told five grand apiece, wasn't it? The guy with long hair looked at his friend and asked not to leave, Chris indignantly looking at him thought, what the hell, he tried so hard, that's the same damn horse radish, he would have tried to catch so much himself. The guy looked at Chris, and then asked what to do, Chris thought Kaziulia. Chris turned to see their squad leader and thought, Digo. Next to him was a guy with a docky by beard and mustache. Chris clutched his chin, puzzled, and then realized that for each of them, at five, he really wasn't up to par, he didn't think he'd be able to set up the traps in time. 
He thought about the red antlered deer, maybe it would be a good option if he caught it, immediately credited it for fulfilling the norm, something that would help him gain the favor of these upstarts. Looking at his older companions, Chris thought with a smile that if he offered it, they wouldn't refuse. The guy with the red hair turned to his charges and said that the end of the hunt, they are going. Chris puzzled asked that everything is already over, but they have not yet fulfilled their norm. A guy with red hair looking at Kazuyulia said that this is why they will get a simple scolding. Kazuyulia looked at him puzzled and asked a simple one. The boy with the red hair glared at Kazuyulia and said, Aha, according to the military discipline of the Count's land, the name is very simple and strict to dispose of. Kazuyulia clutched his face and sobbed desperately. Digo was standing next to him, who asked in fright what he would do. The guy said to take the hairs and look after him. Chris, closing his eyes and holding up a finger, said soldier. The soldier's task on turned around. Chris glared at him, and then said that he wanted to offer them something they couldn't refuse. The soldier said that it wasn't worth it. Chris indignantly asked that maybe they would at least listen. Please. We're being moved tonight. Kazuyulia together with Chris are sitting in the bushes, in front of them a pile of red grass. Kazuyulia puzzled asked if Chris is sure that they will be able to catch a deer. Chris, looking at the red flower in front of them, says that red pole is one of the common red herbs but it is the only food for red deer. The goat looks at Chris with a puzzled expression and then asks what is the reason they picked it. Chris replies that the deer will not miss this grass. Chris and Kazulia continue to stare at her intently. Suddenly Kazulia turns to Chris and wants to say something. Chris replies that he should concentrate and not breathe. Kazulia is puzzled to ask how it is necessary to breathe. Chris, sitting in the bushes and looking at the grass, hears the goat breathing. He thinks that he is a fool. Deer are very sensitive animals. Kazuyulia looks back, and then with a sad look clutches his stomach and asks that if they catch him, then they can eat. Chris thought that of course, you just need to fulfill the norm, and why did they come here then? Suddenly Chris notices something in the distance. Kazuyulia starts to say that it's today, and Chris instantly shuts him up. Chris looks ahead carefully and tells him to keep his voice down. A white deer with red antlers comes out of the bushes, and Chris whispers that they will soon eat their fill. The deer takes off with long leaps. Dust flies out from under his hooves. Someone is running in his footsteps. Chris forcefully swings the stone and then thinks that on his first hunt, he learned to throw stones at the target. He hopes that he will succeed. And then Chris throws a rock with all his might, followed by a puzzled Kazulia. The stone is flying forward at high speed. Then he hits the deer's head with all his might. Chris is puzzled looking ahead and wondering what he hit. A voice is heard in his head that throwing skill is one. But laziness continues to run forward and looking at him Chris and wonder what the hell, he threw even the usual left hand. He runs at great speed after the deer, thinking that maybe he is just a little bit more, this also needs to be taken into account. Suddenly Chris stops and shouts loudly, Digo Doki. Digo and Doki jump out of the bushes in front of the deer. Digo starts yelling at the deer, looking at them Chris thinks that they are smart guys, doing everything right. The deer takes off to the side, and Chris runs after it, wondering what to do next. He looks carefully ahead and thinks that the rest is the soldier's share, how are they going to catch him? We are taken back a few hours, the soldier looking at a pile of red grass with his arms crossed, looking ahead in a puzzled way, Chris is said to be cornered. The soldier turns around, puzzled, and asks where to look in the corner, and Chris answers correctly. Chris kneels on one knee in front of his comrades and says that since they don't have any weapons, they won't take them, it would be better if he went alone, but then nothing would work, the guys will lead him in the direction of the deer. Digo and Doki listened intently. The soldier, looking at Chris in a puzzled way, asked what they wanted to set traps for. Chris replied that yes it is. Chris, looking around, added that, however, they would be required to use force. He drew a route in the sand, and then said that in this hunt, they will have the most important role. The soldier pointed his finger in the sand, and then asked what, that is, they will just have to wait here for the deer. Chris replied with a smile that yes, if they believed in them and didn't catch him themselves. The soldier, looking at Chris, replied that he would. We are transported to the present, the deer running forward at high speed. The soldier and the commander stood behind the trees and pulled a rope in front of the deer. The rope began to rub heavily against the tree. The soldier together with the commander made every effort to stop the deer, the deer at high speed crashed into the rope. The commander holding the rope with both hands shouted that there was something, he caught it. The soldier clenched his teeth, trying to restrain the deer with all his strength. But after a couple of seconds, the commander let go of the rope, and the deer broke forward. Someone picked up a rock from the ground. The soldier shouted that the commander was a fool. Suddenly, the soldier was watching Chris grab a rock and swing it at the powerless deer on the ground. The soldier watched Chris in surprise. A system message popped up in Chris's head, indicating that his experience points had increased. We are carried to the campfire, where the guys gathered, near them lay a dead deer. They stared into the fire in awe. Juicy meat was being fried in the fire, and Kazulia asked them what they were really eating now. 
The commander replied with a smile that it was not so difficult, cause Yulia asked what this deer was so famous for. The commander had a huge bruise on his cheek and continued to say with a smile that for them warriors, it was useless, but for the royal families, venison is a good aphrodisiac. The soldier looked away with interest, and the commander continued to say that they might even get some kind of reward. The soldier told Chris that he was very good, and Chris looked away, puzzled. Chris, looking at the calmly standing soldier, said that it's nothing, isn't it thanks to them. Chris was grinning broadly, and the soldier told him to follow her, then asked what Chris was doing. Chris held out his hand, and there were small petals on them, and he said with a smile that they were the petals of flowers that he had collected in the forest. Chris went on to say that if you grind them and turn them into a powder, you will get a real seasoning. His friends continued to eat fried meat, Chris added, let him try it. The goat was struck like lightning when it took a bite of meat. The soldier also tasted it, and then said that he didn't expect it to taste like this. Chris smiled and looked down in embarrassment, then said that of course it wasn't a classroom kitchen, but he thought it would pass for food. The commanders, looking at Chris, said that he was modest, it was very tasty, Digo added that he still wants it. The soldier, chewing on the meat, asked that his name was Chris, after all. Chris answered yes, puzzled. The soldier smiled and held out a piece of meat to Chris, then said that he was surprised and Chris was relieved of the night's watch. His friends looked at Chris, added that I was from hunting too. Chris took a piece of meat with a smile and then said eat. We are being moved to the barracks. Lind holds up her hands and says it's been a long time since he's had a rest like this. Suddenly, he notices something in front of him. He looks at the happy friends who enter the tent and asks what they're going to do. Chris frowns and says they're already back. Lind started eating the meat and then asked that they were out hunting while he was sleeping. Chris replied to make Lind feel calmer. Lind puzzled asked how long he had slept. Chris looked at Lind's leg and then said that it was all because of the medicinal herbs. For the day, early enough to take a long drag, Lind replied clearly. Chris, looking at Linda's wound, continued to say that the problem was infection. The wound itself is not deep, thank God, now you can not worry. And then Chris smiled at Linda and asked if it tasted good. Suddenly someone shouted that you are such a brute. From such a loud voice, Chris fell into a stupor. A shout came from inside the tent, and the boys turned around, puzzled. The boys stared at the tent's exit with a puzzled expression, and from there came the cry, catch and kill. Chris, looking ahead, asked what was going on. A spilled soup appears in front of us, the guy menacingly says that these dogs. The arrow falls near the dog's leg, the guy shouts that they knocked over his soup, they need to be caught and killed alive. A soldier looking at his comrade who was shooting a bow says bro, don't waste your arrows. They start shouting loudly at each other one of them shouts that these creatures even broke their traps. Then he, in your opinion, should catch them again, someone shouts loudly to stop you already. Lind walks up to Chris and asks what's going on, and Chris says it's some stray dogs. Lind looks ahead admiringly and then asks stray dogs. A dog appears in front of us, its mouth wide open, and Linda asks why they have such faces. The dog was standing in front of the squabbling soldiers, and Chris wondered if these dogs were constantly terrorizing the warriors. Chris smiled and said that if they caught them, the soldier behind him would ask them seriously. He crossed his arms and calmly continued to say that this should not be delayed. If this continues, the morale of the soldiers will be undermined. The soldier glanced at Chris and asked if he could catch them, and Chris confidently replied that of course. Chris glanced at the frightening stray dogs, then said that he would personally deal with them, just let them wait. The soldier started to leave and added, good luck Chris, and Lind asked Chris, puzzled. The soldier continued to walk away, looking menacing, and Chris said they were hunting together, Lind asked if he was a warrior. And then he added, looking at Chris, that by the way, how is he going to catch the dogs? Chris started rummaging through his small purse hanging from his belt, and then said they needed to set up traps, Lind asked what Chris hadn't heard, they were useless. Chris opened his purse and then thought about what to do and said they would work. There was a small spider in his purse, and he was thinking about what he needed to do today. Chris and Lind were walking past the barracks. Suddenly Lind asked why exactly they had to do this. Chris said that they could kill time and get food. Lind thought about it, then said it sounded good, and Chris thought it was just an excuse to get them on their next scouting trip and find some herbs. Digo was standing near the bushes, waving and shouting Chris over here. And then looking at the small grass that has four petals, Digo said that the grass that he asked to find is the same one. Lind plucked a small petal, then examined it and asked if it was an unusual weed. Chris quickly began to collect grass and said that Digo was good. This grass would blow the dogs off the roof, he thought, this is dog rocks at this time they were still unknown. It works like a drug on dogs, so that's why they had those faces. Chris glued all the petals together with a web and then said that it was ready. They'll come here tomorrow and check on the situation. The next day, the dogs lay unconscious, drooling from their mouths. The soldier gave them a puzzled look, 
then asked them what they had done to be in such a state, and Chris replied with a smile that they had had a good dose of sleeping pills. Chris closed his small purse and then thought that the reason why this honey ant was important in his previous life was because it could spin a web with different effects depending on what it eats. Looking at the sleeping dogs, the soldier replied that Chris was a real talent, Chris calmly replied that there might be more packs of strays nearby. And then the soldier asked, puzzled, so what? Chris went on to say that if they took their reserve to investigate, they would catch the others as well. The soldier puzzled, looking at the soldier asked seriously. He looked at Chris and said he was just a private. Chris looked at the soldier with a smile and asked if he didn't think so. He glanced at the soldier and thought that he had a rare red hair color and a well-built figure, not hiding the strength of the spirit. This is the brawler and illegitimate son of Count Van Ludwig, Gillen Ludwig. Gillen smiled, and then, looking at Chris, he said that well, if it came to that, he could consider it a reward for catching that red and red deer. Gillen pointed a finger forward and said that in return, Chris should definitely deal with the dogs. We are being transported to the forest. Chris, along with his companions, runs after the dog with a rope in his hands. Digo shouts in fright to Chris that they haven't gone too far into the depths. Chris keep running after the dog telling him not to worry everything's fine, he reflected that they were almost at the border, of course. Doki and Digo kept running, and Chris told Digo to forgive him for acting like a commander right now. Digo said it was fine, he couldn't help but acknowledge his skills, because Chris had done so much. Chris turned around and looked at Digo and asked really, then let them catch the dogs and join the meat party soon. Suddenly Chris saw something ahead. He let go of the rope that held the dog, and then they all stopped. Puzzled, Digo asking if Chris had heard it, Chris asking what it was. The dog darted into a bush. Chris, looking out from behind the tree, looked at the dogs and wondered if they had found a pack, but I looked ahead carefully and wondered what else was out there. In front of him was a man playing a flute. He was crouched in the bushes, and Chris wondered if this was the enemy's eight-gate row, if it was a scout. The man was playing a flute, and the dogs obediently gathered in a group in front of him. Chris frowned at him and wondered if it was him, the one who had brought the dogs to them. Chris turned to a puzzled Digo and Doki and then asked what they'd ever do. Chris frowned, then asked if anyone had been killed. Digo said only once. Chris, looking ahead, wondered what was going on on the battlefield, and then told them to get ready. Digo looked ahead at the hidden enemy scout playing the flute. He stared at him from behind the bushes, puzzled. Dogs with frenzied faces began to slowly approach the enemy scout. Chris turned to Digo and asked in a whisper how things were going. Digo said it was still the same, and then asked where Doki was. Doki was standing behind a tree, spinning his axes. Digo drew his sword, and then Chris told them to go. The red-robed enemy scout continued to play the flute. Chris came up behind him and heard the scout say that he had only a little more time left. At that moment, Digo swung his spear with great force. The enemy scout had already noticed this. Digo then slammed his spear into a tree with all his might, cutting it open. He looked away, frowning. There, a scout was sitting on the ground, dodging a blow. The enemy scout began to draw his sword from its scabbard. Then he looked around intently. In front of the enemy scout was Digo, armed with a spear, and behind him was Chris, looking menacingly ahead. The scout started to get up quickly, and Digo came right up to him. Suddenly the scout jumped up, and Chris started running towards Digo, shouting something to him. The scout started to run away, and Chris shouted for them to follow. The guys jumped up from their seats, and at full speed rushed in pursuit. The scout continued to run away, looking at him Chris thought that this was expected, that he did not even look after him, because the scouts need to get away from the pursuer as quickly as possible. Chris, along with Digo, started to catch up with the scout, and the scout looked around in fright and saw angry faces. Chris suddenly noticed something and was a little startled. The scout began to reach for his flute. Chris suddenly turned to Digo and yelled at him to hide behind a tree. The scout turned around, and blowing a flute fired a couple of javelins. All the darts missed their target, but got stuck in the bark of the trees. Chris peeked out from behind the tree. A small clearing appeared in front of Chris, where the scout was no longer visible, only one solid dust. The enemy scout continued to run away. He nimbly dodged by jumping over a tree root. And then he turned around and kept running and asked if they were really gone. He gritted his teeth and angrily replied that there wasn't much left if it wasn't for Cirque's fucking assholes. Suddenly, at high speed, an axe was approaching the scout's feet, and the scout, running away, continued to say that he now had no choice but to just go back. The scout deftly dodged the axe flying at him. He looked ahead in fright and saw Doki staring at him in silence, the scout cursed, and then shouted that there was another one. The scout continued to run, but did not notice the spider web stretched between the trees. He hit it with all his strength and almost lost his eyes. Then the scout tumbled to the ground. He was lying on the ground angrily scratching the back of his head. And then, opening my eyes, I saw a terrible picture in front of me. 
In front of him was Doki with an axe, who glared at him and said that they had caught him. Startled, the scout covered his face with his hands, and then Doki swung his axe and smashed the head of the enemy scout, blood flying everywhere. Digo and Chris watched in horror. The body of the lifeless scout lay on the ground, his blood spilling everywhere. Digo looked at him and asked what he expected when he came here. Doki lost his axe to blood, and Chris turned to Digo, praising him and saying that it was the shortest way to get close to the enemy. Then Chris grabbed the scout's flute and said, looking ahead, that all they had to do now was deal with the dogs. In the next second, the dog's head flew off its neck. Chris, along with his comrades, finished off the remaining ones, making sure that everyone was dead. Suddenly a couple of dogs ran away. Digo looking at them puzzled asked what they should do with those that escaped, unless they will come back to them again. Chris calmly replied that let them run away, they have already removed their leader and the one who managed it, so he does not think that they are they will appear again. Chris looked at the torn and bitten corpses of the dogs and asked if it was really Doki. Suddenly, someone pushed Chris, and he fell to the ground and shouted in fright, what's wrong? Digo, along with Doki, looked ahead in puzzlement, and then said there. Chris turned around and saw among the corpses of the dogs a huge white wolf that was covered in scars, he asked in fright that it was a wolf. Looking at its bright yellow eye, he was puzzled to think that the white wolf, they only live on Mount Saul, as this one wandered here. Chris stared ahead, startled, and then wondered if the guy had gathered a pack of dogs to catch him. The wolf could no longer stand on its feet due to its severe wounds, and it fell dead in front of Chris. Chris drew his dagger from its scabbard and then said that he was smart to think of such a thing, but instead of him, they would take the wolf's skin. Suddenly Chris saw something near the wolf and said it couldn't be. He walked over to the dead wolf with a smile, then picked up something. Digo gave Chris a puzzled look and then asked if he needed help. Chris was looking at something carefully and then told him to look here. Chris held up a small wolf with a long yellow line running from its tail to its head, then said that the cub had survived. Digo carefully examined the cub and said that it was true, but he did not think that he was a little different from his mother. Chris petted the little wolf cub and then said that it was because he was a half-breed. We are taken to the barracks in the evening, where the soldiers gather around the campfire and have dinner. Kazulia enviously watches from behind the tent as one of the soldiers is about to eat a piece of meat. He goes back inside and frustrated tells Lin that he really wants to eat. Lin looks down at something, and then thinks that it is the duty of a scout to be the first to go to the front and keep an eye on the enemy. Lin looks at Kazulia, who is sitting across from her, and then wonders why Chris has taken such a dangerous position, even though it's not so safe in their reserve. Lin remembered Chris calling out to him. Chris a few years ago, with a small bag slung over his shoulders, looked at Lin and said that this was a good opportunity for them to get hold of. Lin puzzledly asked what he was talking about. Chris looked at Lin with a smile and said that he would soon become a military commander, everything would be covered in chocolate, Lin replied that it sounded like sarcasm. They followed the rest of the recruits together, and then Lin said that if Chris became a warlord, then he would be a chancellor, and Chris laughed. They're taking us back, and Lin thinks sadly that he's serious about doing this. Suddenly Kazuyulia stood in front of Lin and clenched his fist and said that he couldn't take it anymore, Lin asked in a puzzled voice that Kazuyulia would really go. Kazuyulia sternly said that Chris had caught the dogs, but they couldn't even smell the food, even if they were given a piece of bread. Kazuyulia threw the stone aside, and then said that they would have to steal it. Lin closed his eyes and said that Kazuyulia understood that if he got caught, everyone would be slapped in the ears. Kazuyulia was about to leave the tent, but suddenly noticed something. Puzzled, Lin turned to leave the tent and heard a voice say, What are you doing? Chris was standing in front of the goat, holding a piece of meat in his hands, and he told them to light the fire with a smile. The children happily began to eat meat, and Chris watched with a smile. Chris, looking at them, said that they should eat slowly. Lind looked at Chris carefully, and then asked why he wasn't eating himself. Chris replied that they had already eaten a little before coming. Chris looked down at the munching Digo, and then at the chewing Doki. He smiled and said they should eat, but Lind suddenly said there was someone staring at them. The guys turned around and saw a guy standing behind the tent. Lind asked that they would not be discovered. The guy had a cracked lip, thin cheeks, and a rumbling stomach. Lin said it looked like the guy was just hungry, Digo suggested calling him, and Chris looked at the guy with a puzzled expression and asked if they thought it was worth it. Lin looked at Chris and asked why not, they were chewing on the air before Chris came, too, and Kazulia said with a smile that they needed to call him. Chris glanced at the goat, and then thought, of course, until he ate it all himself. A guy with a bald head walked up to them and started chewing on the meat. He wiped his mouth, and then apologized, and said that he was cleaning the pig pen, and therefore, he stinks, goat puzzled asked that they had pigs or something, here they are bellies, they even spared a piece of bread. Lin closed his eyes and said that if he got the position of commander, he would be able to try pork, and they would not be given any help from the servants. The guy continued to eat meat, and then with a sad look was going to say something, Chris looking at him thought that if they try, then maybe at least the pig's milk will get. 
The guy looked at the pieces of meat and then said in a trembling voice that there were several more people in the barracks. Kazuyulia replied that he should quickly translate how many of them there were. The guy replied, 20, and in the same second the whole crowd gathered around the fire. Chris looking at them said that as there is too much he means a few. The two barracks started having a boisterous dinner. Chris, looking at them, thought that he wanted to leave some, of course. Lind looked at Chris with a smile and said that it's better to eat together, isn't it? Chris said that it is, in difficult times you need to share. Chris looked at the soldiers who were enjoying their meal and said that it couldn't be helped. And then he added that they should have already fried everything without a trace. Morning came, and the fire went out, a little smoke coming from it. Someone was bailing water out of a bowl with their tongue. Kazuya put his hand to his face and said that they had had a good time last night. Chris looked at the little wolf, who was drinking water, and wondered who his dad was. The wolf continued to drink water, and Chris thought that judging by the red color of the eyes, and the unusual stripes, maybe it's a golden wolf, he heard that they can even breathe fire. When the puppy grows up, he can do it too. The puppy turned around and drank some water and was about to go somewhere. Lind asked if Chris had given him a name. Chris replied that since he was crossbred with two different species, his name will be Pullen, and Lind looked at Chris with disgust. Then Chris continued to sort through the Canthon options, and Kazulia and Digo looked at Chris with distaste. Chris turned around with a smile and told them not to look at him like that, he was just joking. He glanced at the little wolf cub and then said that it would be a pumpkin. Suddenly, a soldier on the street shouted that it was an inspection, a general gathering. Chris stroking the pumpkin looked away in puzzlement and then wondered why this inspection was happening all of a sudden. The soldiers went out into the street. They crowded together, Chris leading the way, and he sighed heavily. He closed his eyes and thought discontentedly, what is this K.H. Vilkin? Why is he doing this? It was possible to do everything quietly without formalities. Someone called out to Reese saying, Reserve squad. Chris shouted loudly that yes, he is a warrior Chris. The guy in the green suit told Chris to come over to him, and Chris started walking, thinking that the stares of the others were making him a little nervous. Chris looked ahead and wondered what it was like, the person standing in front of him. Standing in front of Chris was a middle-aged man with a neat mustache and small beard and long hair, dressed in expensive green clothes, and Chris thought that the leader of the century and leader of Infantry Regiment 7, Commander Kennery. Kennery raised his hands to Reese and said that he recognized his many exploits, including killing an enemy scout, and appointed Chris, a reserve private, as commander of the Decurion, then added that they were counting on him. Chris looked at Kennery in surprise, and then said that he would do his best to shout from the crowd that Chris was cool. There were enthusiastic shouts from the fighters that he was their hunter Chris. Chris thought that he didn't expect such an effect after just sharing the meat with them. Kennery looked around in confusion and then blushed and said that he could see that Chris was popular, that he had given them something to drink, Kennery that he could smell alcohol. Chris scratched the back of his head, then smiled and said he was a pretty private guy. Kennery responded well, a shout came from the crowd, their meat rich Chris. Chris reflected that at a time when his appointment to the position was already drawing to a close. Chris turned around, puzzled. He saw several disgruntled commanders looking at him as if they were ready to kill him. Next to Chris was his dog Pumpkin, wagging his tail in a friendly manner. Chris patted him, and then thought that while it was normal, it was hard for them to accept a youngster like him as their equal. Digo came up behind him, he smiled and said that Chris now he should call him commander. Chris smiled and thought that this was a good idea, but Chris smiled and turned around, then said I'd rather use my first name. And then he added that by the way, they need to slowly prepare. Kazulia and Digo looked at Chris with a puzzled look and then asked why. Chris, smiling, stroked the pumpkin and then said that to explore. We are taken to the field and our friends go on briskly. Lind, sweating in the heat, asked how long they had been walking. Kazuyulia, exhausted, added that it was 10 o'clock, confidently replied to Reese that four hours had just passed, and then someone called Chris, addressing him as the commander of the Decurion. Chris turned around, puzzled, and someone asked him how he was feeling. He folded his hands and smiled at Chris. Chris, turning around, said that it was fine for now, and then Gillen asked if Chris knew that most often scouts die from units, even if they were not able to visit the battlefield. Gillen turned to Chris' team and then told him to look at his guys, they would definitely last. Chris glared at Gillen, then said they weren't going to die like flies, so don't worry. Gillen looked at Chris with a smile, and then said that he hoped so, because it would be a disappointment if their scouting party died. Gillen wondered if, of course, Gillen might have gotten the nickname Gillen of the guillotine after killing his own brothers, but he wondered if there was anything to worry about just yet. Lind and Digo looked ahead, then Lind said it looked like they were there. A large swamp appeared in front of the team. The guys were sitting in the middle of the forest, Kazuulia began to yawn. And then Lin pulled out a small honeycomb from his bag and pulled it forward, said, Take it, the guys asked in a puzzled way what it was. Lin and his companions began to eat the honeycomb, and then Lin explained that Chris had obtained this honey while hunting red horn deer. Digo said quite happily that it was very sweet. 
Chris pulled up his sleeves and looked out over the swamp, thinking that there was no one else to reach her. His first goal, which was why he wanted to be in the scouting party. Chris stuck his hand straight into the swamp, and then, with his hand completely submerged, he began to dig into it. Suddenly, he took out his hand, in which there were small seaweed. Looking at them, he thought that this is a dirty maiden, this grass will definitely be useful to him. They carry us to the tent, Lind yawns, and then says that they just walked around, being a scout, but it's not so easy, Kazuyulia, and looked at the ceiling in the tent, and then said that it was finally sewn up. Kazuyulia, looking at the sleeping pumpkin, asked what happened to Chris by the way. We are taken to Chris' place and he goes to the tent where two guards are standing. They block Chris' path with their spears and tell him to stand menacingly. Chris calmly replies that the commander of the scout Decurion, Chris, has come to the head of infantry regiment number 7 to denounce the intelligence service, but the guard didn't put his spear away, and Chris looked at him with a puzzled expression. The guard left. His companion started laughing too, and then apologized to Chris. The guard grabbed Chris' head and laughed, saying that he wasn't going to apologize to the Decurion commander. The guard patted Chris on the back and then asked if he was okay. Chris reflected that there was no discipline involved. Suddenly, Chris kicked the guard's full strength. He screamed in pain, clutching his leg. At the same time, Chris hit him across the face with an elbow, and then Chris was sitting across from the guard, who was leaning against a tree. The guard woke up, and then Chris told him to think that it was a lesson, if next time he didn't repeat his mistake, he would live. The guard's companion was embarrassed by these words, he looked at Chris with a puzzled expression and asked what. He grabbed his spear and prepared to strike, but Chris stopped the spear and glared at him and told him to get a private, because it was going to look like a riot. The guard was startled by these words. Chris gave the guard a frightening look. Suddenly, someone came up behind the guard and ordered him to stop. It was a middle-aged guy, he looked at the guard sternly, and then asked if he wanted to lose his head for such tricks, the guard said in a frightened voice that the commander of the Decurion Pedal. And then Pedal told the guard to get that idiot out of here as soon as possible. The guard, along with his fellow Lovely, stayed behind, and Pedal asked if Chris had ever heard his name. Chris said yes Pedal. Pedal looked at Chris with admiration, and then asked him what it was about the intelligence report. Chris, sitting under a tree with Kalia, began to tell us that there was a small hill 50 paces away, and there, in that direction, there was a swamp. Petal replied that they had quite a lot of unregistered information about the area. By the way, their group, out of all the reconnaissance units, had the best results. Chris with a smile, he asked if it was true. Chris, smiling at Kalia, continued to say that by the way, what does the head of an infantry regiment do? He's not even an adjutant to be responsible for such work. Petal looked puzzled, and Chris wondered what kind of alcohol he'd called from Petal a kilometer away. Chris, looking at the tent, continued to say that he was originally a knight of Baron Rommel. Chris asked in a puzzled manner as a knight. The commander was sitting in the tent drinking alcohol. Chris asked what kind of aristocrat is rotting here then. The commander inside the tent was drinking a huge amount of alcohol and began to breathe heavily, while Petal continued to say that he had a very good relationship with the Baron's wife. Chris looked at Kalia with a smile, shouted, with the spouse and the baron, this is Tin, Petal replied that yes, that's why he was demoted to the rank of an ordinary infantryman. Chris carefully looked at Cole who said the commander. He stared madly into the void, then added that he thought this place was a grave. Chris quickly ran through the forest, and then thought that now everything was clear to him, the reason why the 7th Infantry Regiment had died in his previous life. Chris continued to make his way through the trees, thinking that the commander of the military unit who knew about the war had fallen into despair and left the privates to their fate. Chris kept running fast, thinking that if he didn't do something, it would all happen again. Chris stopped abruptly, then asked if it was around here somewhere. There was a clear field in front of Chris, and he wondered what he thought was the average field here. Between the 8th gate and their military headquarters, if they meet up with a scouting party, it's the end. Chris walked into the field and then bent down to say that he was sure it was here. Suddenly, he turned around. He reached the end of the field where there was a small cliff and glanced at the enemy soldiers walking by. He looked at them with a smile and wondered what he had finally found, the delivery route of the 8th gate. He looked down with interest, then wondered if he was late, if this was a secret shipment of alcohol. There were two carts in front of him, he thought that compared to the number of troops, as it turns out there is not enough, they move once a day, there should be at least five sentries on the minibus, and a maximum of ten. Chris smiled, and then continued to think that everything should work out. The carts left, and Chris rustled in the bushes, wondering if he should go back, if he would have to pick up the dog skins on the way anyway. Chris went back to the tent with his companions, panting for breath, and Lind looked at him with a puzzled expression, then asked him what he was doing. Lind looked at Chris in surprise, and Chris said he would tell him later, and then Chris asked Lind for a long stick. 
Chris asked Digo and Kazuya to find him daggers, they looked at him in surprise, but did not resist, Kazuya replied that he understood. And then Chris connected the dagger to the stick, began to tie the rope around them, he thought that such a 3rd rate 7th infantry regiment always has not enough supplies, and what delivers is of poor quality. Chris tightened the rope with his teeth, and then thought that it would be better not to bring anything at all then. Chris glanced at the stick with the dagger, and then said that the daggers connected to the sticks are a replica and the shield and dog skin. Lind gave Chris a puzzled look and then asked that they were preparing for war. Chris calmly turned around and glared at Lind, then asked him what he was even talking about, the war had already begun. The boys looked at Chris blankly. Chris closed his eyes and thought about the complete lack of discipline, then told them to take their weapons and go outside. The guys looked at their new weapons with interest, and then Chris announced that if they start training today, they will learn how to use weapons. Chris then carefully watched his companions and shouted to them. Digo was defending himself with a dogskin shield when Lind attacked him. Guys from other squads looked at them without understanding one of them asked what they were doing. His friend replied that he did not know the type of training. The guy came up to Chris and asked what they were doing on the sly, and Chris looked at them with a smile and then thought that it was right to let them watch for this and not hear. The guy went up to Lind and said the kid was going to get hurt, the dagger had to be handled differently, and the other guy said the private kid shouldn't listen to him. The soldiers began to actively observe and give advice to Chris's squad. Pedal came up behind Chris and looked at him with a smile, thinking that he was probably shocked by his words, although he meant that he should give up. Chris, looking at all this, thought with a smile that the atmosphere is completely changing, but now there is a problem. The commander with the long hair Kennery how they all betray him. Chris, looking ahead, said what they needed first. He glanced at his companions and then thought that they were already heading in the right direction. He thought that was enough for today. Suddenly, someone came up to Chris and said that he could see that he was having fun here. Chris looked away, puzzled. Gillen appeared in front of him. Gillen came up to Chris and asked if he thought it was worth it. Chris said it was necessary, which seemed like a good thing. Gillen folded his hands in thought, and looking at him Chris thought that by the way, this aristocrat how long is he going to pretend to be an ordinary private? Gillen of the guillotine, although he doesn't look particularly friendly, he doesn't seem like someone who can do such things. Chris looked at Gillen with a puzzled expression, and then wondered if he would really slaughter his brothers. Gillen looking ahead said that there was a way to save the 7th Infantry Regiment. Gillen smiled, then calmly replied that Kennery should be killed. Chris wondered, startled, what? And then, remembering Kennery, Chris realized that while it wasn't really surprising, it was obvious that the 7th Infantry Regiment's main problem was Kennery. Therefore, after his death, Van Ludwig will appoint a new head of the military unit, perhaps it will be Petal. If Kennery dies, then the spiders will have a great chance to get up, this is really the fastest way. However, there are people on his side, all thanks to the aides de camp who continue to faithfully follow Kennery despite his nightmarish treatment of them. Padella included, he had several other Decurian commanders on his side. Chris dreadfully imagined how he would kill Kennery and then wondered what would happen the moment he died. Someone's blade is bound to cut through him, too. Chris frowned, thinking that this was the fastest, but at the same time, the worst option. Gillen started to walk away from Chris and then said that his expression was not very cheerful. Chris looked at Gillen and thought that he would look at himself. Chris watched him go, wondering if he was a villain or not. Chris smiled and then wondered if Gillen might not hear this, but if there was another way to save the regiment. We are being carried to the tent. Chris flies into it and shouts to his teammates attention, they are going to meet in 40 minutes, everyone needs to get weapons and equipment for the bivouac. He, looking menacingly ahead, adds that they are going on a mission. Chris plucked a black fruit from the tree. Looking at it, he thought with a smile that they had made good time, tonight, there shouldn't be any problems. Chris nimbly jumped down from the tree to join them. He looked at them with a smile, then asked what they were going to do next. It was a dark night. Chris raised his hand, giving his companions a gesture. The guys stopped behind Chris while they were shoulder deep in the grass, and Chris whispered to them to stop. This is where the enemy territory begins, from now on, you need to be even more careful. Kazuya looked in different directions and then turned to Chris and said that by the way, is it too dark? Chris replied that it is, and it's time for a snack. Chris picked up a black fruit and then said that this fruit is called Head is Sorrow. Chris started to cut up the fruit, which spilled red juice, and then said that the side effect of excessive consumption is blindness, it is considered poisonous, but if you eat it together with white grass. Kazuya ate the black fruit and then calmly said that it didn't taste so bad. Kazuya looked away, puzzled, and then suddenly, his eyes began to glow with a white light. He looked at the puzzled kids and didn't understand why he could see like this in the daytime. Chris calmly continued to say that his eyes were gaining the ability to see in the dark. Chris looked calmly at his companion, then said that this effect lasts exactly one day, you need to finish all of them at once. Chris walked up to the tree and saw a small fire at the end of the clearing. 
Chris glanced at his comrades, who were preparing for battle, and then wondered if they had set up a camp, now it was only a matter of figuring out how many people were there. Chris turned to Lind and asked if he could see anything, and Lind frowned and said sternly, just a second. His eyes were a bright turquoise, and as Chris looked at him, he thought that Lin's eyesight had been unusually good for a long time, and the more he saw, the more surprised he became. Lin glanced at the enemy camp, where the soldiers were calmly resting, and then said that there were five of them. Chris, looking ahead, thought that five people, although this is a smaller part of the troops, but even for such strongmen as Digo and Doki, who can easily take down two, this is too much. Digo frowned at Chris, then asked why they were mobbing him. Chris turned to Digo and told him that if they missed one, they were dead. For them, the best option is if they lead them to a dark place. Lin turned to Chris, puzzled, and asked why. Looking at Linda, Chris wondered that his young face was without a single wrinkle. Who would have taken him for a soldier if he was in ordinary clothes? Chris, looking ahead, thought that he had the same problem, even if it would be a big risk, but it was worth a try. The bonfire of enemy soldiers was burning brightly, someone shouted pancake. The soldier asked his comrade why he always cheated, and the latter replied with a smile that he was offended, in fact. Suddenly the bushes began to move, and the soldier turned around in a puzzled manner, while the soldier's comrade shouted that this was the seventh batch. The soldier calmly said that his comrades should take a copy, and the soldier asked in fright what he was doing all of a sudden. Enemy soldiers looking at the bushes shouted loudly who is there, let them come out. A barefoot emerged from the bushes. Chris was standing in front of the enemy soldiers, his clothes torn. His body was covered with a large number of abrasions and dirt. The soldier looked at him with a puzzled look and asked what. The soldier's companion laughed at Chris and then said that it was just a child. The soldier replied that he didn't think so. Looking at Chris' startled expression, he wondered if his outfit made him look like a deserter's slave. If he was really a slave, then he could get good money for it. The commander of the enemy squad made a sign and ordered the spears to be lowered, and then said that it would be more trouble if the child got scared and ran away. The commander came up to Chris, then handed him a piece of meat and asked him with a smile what he had lost on the way if he wanted beef jerky to eat. Suddenly Chris whispered something and started to turn around. The enemy commander gritted his teeth and shouted that one of them would be enough to catch up with the kid. The commander and his subordinate ran across the field after Chris. Chris turned and looked at them. The enemy soldiers ran after him in anger. Suddenly, Chris stumbled and fell, scratching the ground with his face. He started to get up, examining his bruised knee. A figure suddenly appeared in front of Chris. In front of Chris were two enemy soldiers who were panting and glaring at Chris in anger. The enemy commander looked at Chris with a scary face and then asked whether to beat him up or immediately kill him. Chris looked around, the enemy commander continued to tell him not to make him angry. The enemy commander was about to say something when he suddenly noticed an axe rapidly approaching his head. In the next second, the enemy commander's head lay lifeless on the ground. The enemy soldier shouted in fright, already surrounded on all sides. The soldier looked around and asked fearfully who are you. The soldiers who remained in the camp were sitting quietly, but one of them began to get nervous, he looked into the bushes, and then asked why the commander took them so long, he couldn't catch the child, the case smells fried, he will go check what is there. The enemy soldier looked away, puzzled. He started walking towards his spear when he suddenly noticed something in the darkness. At the same time, Digo pierced the soldier's neck with his spear. The soldier's companion watched his friend's death in dismay, and then the axe appeared. Doki plunged an axe into the head of an enemy soldier. Digo shouted loudly, looking to the side that was left alone. The soldier was watching the death of his comrades in fright, and Chris appeared from behind the bushes. The soldier started to turn around in fright, and at that moment Chris was running towards him at full speed, holding a spear in his hands. The soldier loudly shouted attack. At the same time, he fell silent, sensing something. Lind and Kazuya stuck their spears in the soldier's throat. The soldier coughed up blood. Then he fell to the ground, dead. The moon came out from behind the clouds and lit up the earth. Chris looked at his teammates with a smile and said that they had done a good job. And then Chris turned to look at Lind, who was staring off into the distance. There was a road behind them where the wagon tracks had been left, and Chris said that now they had the last step left. We are shown a cart that is moving quickly somewhere. These are the enemy's two carts carrying resources to the enemy. A soldier appears in front of the cart and gestures to stop it. A voice comes from the carriage, looking at the two soldiers standing in the middle of the road. A man with a small beard stares at the knight standing in front of him, and then asks the new ones, although this is not the first time to be surprised. Chris in the armor of an enemy soldier stands next to Doki. He looks towards the coachman and then says that there will be a delivery any minute. Someone's hand is combing the ground. An enemy soldier touches the remains of the fire, and then they think that the ashes and disorderly traces. Another soldier says to quickly let them dig through everything here. A soldier digging in the ground found traces of blood and then wondered if someone had erased them. Someone from the side shouted to the soldier, Commander, look. 
The commander looked fearfully behind the bushes and saw a pair of blue corpses lying on the ground. They were lying on the ground without armor, and the top was strewn with leaves and grass. What the commander saw really pissed him off, he screamed, the fucking bastards of Circa. They take us to Kenneries, where he's lying in a tent, the sunlight falling on his eyes. He is attracted to some noise on the street and gradually begins to get up. When he went outside, he saw his squad practicing with spears. A guy with a scar on his face yells at the soldiers not to use their hands, but their elbows. Petal approaches Kennery and asks the commander if he is awake. Kennery replies that he is, and then asks what they have been plowing since morning. Petal looks at the knight's training and then tells them that everyone wants to survive. Petal examines his commanding officer carefully, then says that he's done with proper training. But suddenly Kennery interrupts him and says enough is enough. Petal looks at the commander with interest, and then they ask what he forbids. The commander, looking at his soldiers, calmly replies that they have almost run out of supplies. Petal closes his eyes and wonders what he doesn't want to admit, but it's true. Looking at the soldiers' training, he keeps thinking that the 7th Infantry Regiment was abandoned by the Count, the supplies aren't enough, so they're almost at their limit. And then Kennery turns to Petal and tells him to go to the 6th Regiment, and Petal the Stern says he refuses. And then suddenly someone shouts cart, which gets Kennery's attention. Kennery looks in the direction where Chris is riding with the cart, puzzled. Petal looks at Chris with a puzzled expression, not sure where he got it from. Chris drives two carts to the barracks and stops. The soldiers surround her and start talking about how it's not a supply wagon, but they have an eight-gate mark on them, don't they? The soldiers delightedly take out meat and alcohol from the strip. Petal gives Chris a puzzled look and then asks how he did it. Chris replies that it's nothing special, it's just that they stole it. Someone raises a glass of alcohol, accidentally dousing Chris, and shouts, attention. The guy with the scarred face happily says that they will drink to the hero of their 7th regiment, the brave Chris. The campfire begins to crackle affably. The soldiers are gathered around him, and the scar-faced guy turns to Chris, smiling, and says thank you, then adds that he hasn't eaten so well in a long time. The scarred guy shakes Chris's hand and then says he's Ralph. Chris replies that it's nice to meet him. Suddenly, a bald guy approaches Chris, and Chris looks at him with a puzzled expression. The guy approaches a surprised Chris and says that he apologizes for the tactlessness of the scouting squad last time. He bows to Chris and then asks about his soldiers who started a riot. If Chris doesn't mind, he will get them for as long as he asks. Chris waves it off and says that everything is fine hushed up already. Ralph laughs and then says he's watching. Chris is very friendly. They laugh and chat together, Kennery sitting behind them. He watches them carefully and then thinks that this kid is only 15, but he has already been able to defeat enemies on scouting and even bring loot. Looking at Chris, he adds in his mind that this was a foolhardy plan. Kennery squeezes the glass hard and then says, but he was able to. Kennery recalls that he once had those times, too. A warrior appears in front of us, leaning on a stick. He can barely stand on his feet. His comrades turn to him and ask what is wrong with him. Another soldier says that he is drunk and needs to go to sleep. The guy doesn't move, he's foaming at the mouth, and the soldier says someone took him to bed. Suddenly, a drunk guy hits the ground with a stick, and then he opens his mouth and starts screaming. He raises a stick and shouts that he will survive. Ralph looks at him, startled. Chris also turns around, puzzled. Then she stares at the boy. Kennery smiles at the beginning, and then he looks at the guy, dumbfounded. Chris closes his eyes and then shouts that, of course, you have to live, why die? The soldiers laugh, looking at the drunk guy and say that they will stop brawling. Suddenly, the Kennerys set their glass down on a log, and Petal turns around, looking puzzled. Petal turns to the commander, but he goes into the tent. And then Petal sees a shocking picture. The commander's glass of alcohol was completely filled. Kennery was putting on his gold armor. Petal went to his tent and told him that everything was ready. Kennery stepped out in front of the lined up soldiers. His armor was indescribably beautiful, and then he turned to the soldiers and said that today, they will start official training. Chris, along with Ralph, began to train hard. All the soldiers were doing a jog, training their stamina. This was the second day of official training, the first start of running training. Chris, as he ran, remembered what Petal had said to Kennery. He had asked that Chris was now the commander of the Decurion. Kennery had said that he was something, let him participate. Chris had thought that this was not good. Chris ran with Ralph. Ralph, smiling, told Chris that he was a good runner, but Chris didn't say anything, just wondered why Ralph always stuck to him. At the lunch training session, Kennery personally showed off his spear skills. Chris admired Kennery, thinking that he was a knight after all. And then Chris asked Kennery to teach Lind how to shoot a bow, because right now it's too much for him to pull a bowstring. Lind clenched his teeth as he pulled it on, and Chris thought that in his previous life, Lind was very good with a bow, and with his amazing eyesight, this weapon was the most suitable. Chris lunged with his spear, hitting Digo's shield. Digo glared at Chris, and then the commander shouted change of position. Digo looked at Chris, panting, and then said, Commander Crisis, now it's your turn. 
Chris was sweating profusely, and as he looked at Digo indifferently, he wondered if Digo thought he would accept a spear from someone like him. Suddenly, one of the soldiers in the crowd called out to Chris that his name was called. Chris smiled, looked at Digo and excused himself saying that he was busy. At the same time, Chris ran away from the puzzled Digo. Chris went into the tent and said that the Decurian commander Chris had arrived. Someone was standing in front of Chris he said that then he would go. Gillen looked at Chris with a smile as he left, and Chris asked him, puzzled, what he was doing here. Gillen came out of the tent, Kennery said he was a messenger from the 6th Infantry Regiment, and Chris looked at him and smiled, then thought that he played perfectly. Kennery covered his face with his hand and began to say that in two days, group training starts, they should show what they are worth. Kennery asked if there was a way, Chris Com thought that it was only two days. Chris replied by looking at Kennery that he was there, they needed to attack the supply position of the 8th gate. Kennery asked him if he was joking. Chris replied that you need what he brought, but in three days, real experience is a good opportunity to grow up for still young soldiers. Kennery replied that this was bullshit, there would be numerous casualties among their soldiers, whom they trained so well. Chris placed his hands on the table, then said in a menacing tone that they wouldn't act thoughtlessly, if they prepared carefully and attacked from the shadows, they would be able to minimize the damage. Kennery stared at Chris. Chris calmly replied that they would attack suddenly. Kennery got up and sat at the table, and then asked Chris how many times he had tried to grab someone else's supply cart. Chris replied alone, he would have already started preparing. Kennery looked away for a moment and then said that he thought they were going to fight the elite soldiers they needed to attack at night. Kennery glanced at Chris and then said that even if there were casualties and they were going to move in the afternoon. Chris leaned on the table, puzzled, and asked if Kennery didn't think it made any sense. Kennery said that their opponents were not fools. Chris, looking at the table calmly continued to say that they will not fall for the same trick twice, first they need to. Chris pointed to a spot on the map with his fingers, and then said that they would form a strike group to deal with the enemy scouts, and then they would move their main force gradually. Kennery looked at Chris and then said that if there was any mishap in the strike group, Chris did not finish listening and immediately replied, then let them immediately return the main force back. Chris looked at Kennery carefully, then realized that even if they failed, the main force would not be in any danger. Kennery put his hand under his chin and then thought. Looking at him Chris wondered if he was going to say no. Kennery said that then they should include Petal and Ralph in the strike group. Chris looked at Kennery with a smile and then said that this is a great solution. He thought that Kennery is not a coward. Kennery, looking at the map, said that then they would move out at night. Kennery frowned at Chris then told him to gather all the Decurian commanders. We are transferred to the next day, the soldiers move out in an even formation. Kennery leads the way, followed by a couple of commanders, the Decurian commanders who know their strategy couldn't hide the worry on their faces. The soldiers were moving forward, one of them said that they should definitely grab supplies and where they were going. The other replied that he didn't know, just wanted to rest as soon as possible, their plans were assigned not only to ordinary privates. The advance party of seven, including Petal and Ralph, had set out a few hours earlier. Ralph looked away with a smile and then said it was just crazy. Petal looked in front of him with a puzzled expression and then said he knew it right away. Lind looked ahead, and then Chris looked at him and asked what he saw, and Lind frowned and said there were four enemy scouts. Ralph looked in front of him, startled, and then asked what you saw, and Petal said he really had hawk's eye. When looking at the hill in front of them asked what their route was, Lind replied that they were moving to the right, he thought they would be able to see their main force. Chris glared at his companions and then told them to listen carefully, they would make a detour and attack the enemy from behind, they couldn't miss any of them. Enemy scouts from the hill were watching Circo's soldiers. One of them asked why the Circs were stupid at all, what they were doing in the daytime, and the other, looking fearfully at the large army, said that they needed to return to the main forces. Suddenly, a rock hit the enemy soldier's helmet. He and his companions turned around in fright. Kaziulia, who was holding spears, and Chris, who was holding a rock, appeared in front of them. The enemy scouts furiously shouted that they needed to attack and kill these two. Chris shouted at the fleeing Kaziulia to run back. Kaziulia nodded in understanding. The enemy scout drew his sword, then glared at Chris and said that he would kill him. Suddenly, Daki appeared behind the scouts and did a deft forward somersault. Then he slashed open the back of one of the scouts with an axe, spurting a large stream of blood. The enemy scout turned around angrily, and looking at Daki shouted ambush. The enemy scout swung his sword at Daki, and then Digo appeared from somewhere and killed him by piercing his neck. The two enemy scouts watched in fright as their comrades were killed one by one, one of them wondering if it was a trap. The enemy scout, looking at Digo Kazulia and Chris, thought that she was three, a gang. The two enemies rushed in different directions, shouting, retreat. Chris, looking at them calmly, said that he didn't seem to know what to do. An enemy scout was standing in front of a knight, when his comrade was running away, the knight said that to him. He looked at the scout with a smile, and then took out his sword and said that he was already finished. 
Ralph swung with great force and swung the scout's head with one blow. The scout kept running away, he was only one. Chris, looking away, shouted loudly to Lind. Lind came out from behind the bushes, drawing his bowstring. The scout turned around in fright and saw Lind in front of his face, he wondered if they even had an archer. The scout immediately changed direction in front of Lind to avoid the arrow. But in front of the scout appeared Petal who looked at him with anger. Petal flew into the scout at high speed, piercing him with his sword. The scout grunted, and Kazuyulia watched with a puzzled expression. Looking at the flying blood, Kazuyulia said that it was fast. The scout was sitting under a tree, there were many bruises on his face, looking at him, someone said, which means, after that, the escort troops were added to the transportation groups, they were sent from the main unit. Chris thought about it, and the scout replied that yes, that's right, Chris thought that there it is, such changes should not interfere with their surprise attack. Petal, looking at his comrades, said that the task of the strike group was over, they had already dealt with the scouts, Chris, standing on one knee, replied that no, they still had work to do. And then he added that this was an order, Kazuulia immediately saluted and said eat. Chris, looking at the scout, said that they should tell the main unit that the time has come, and Ralph and Petal looked at Chris with a puzzled expression. Chris turned around and replied with a crazy smile that what was started should be finished. Right. We are being transported to the enemy camp. Two carts filled with supplies are coming down the road, and one of the soldiers shouts that a supply cart has arrived. Chris takes off the enemy soldier's helmet and looks around in surprise. Chris is approached by a middle-aged soldier, who says that a long time has passed since they were robbed, their escort force has decreased, there are no special incidents, Chris laughed and said that no special incidents have occurred, but instructions were given to inspect the transported supplies. The enemy soldier glared at Chris, then asked who gave the order, what the hell kind of inspection, and then the enemy soldier shouted to his comrade to show these guys what they have here. The soldier pointed a finger at their habits and said that this was where they had a food depot. Chris pointed to the other tents and asked what was in there, and the soldier said it was oil storage. Chris, smiling, asked Lind in a whisper what he had checked, Lind yes. Chris, looking at the young soldier, thanked him for the information, and then added something else. Chris looked at the bald man standing outside the tent who had a scar on his lip and asked if that person was their commander that's right. And then Chris, along with his comrades, turned around and thanked them, and then said that they would go, the enemy soldier asked by the way. He looked at Chris with a smile, and then added where they came from, he was assigned here too, just like them, but he had never seen any of them before. He turned to Reese with a smile, and then tried to say something, but it didn't work out, the soldier asked again where are you from. The young soldier continued to say with a smile that it was a bit suspicious of soldier Digo. After a while, a young soldier with swollen cheeks lay unconscious by the barrels, Chris calmly told everyone to take their positions and wait for the right moment. Chris tore up the tent with his dagger, then turned to Digo and said he would give the signal. Chris peeked out from behind the tent, then grabbed his knife and told them to take a closer look. He swung and aimed at the commander of the enemy squad, then thought that the distance was not bad, but no. Chris swung his dagger, and then considered what would be just right. He threw the dagger with all his strength at the opponent. But suddenly, a soldier came out of the tent where the enemy commander was standing. At the same time, the soldier fell down dead with a dagger stuck in his head, and the enemy commander looked at him with a puzzled expression. Then he took a startled breath into his lungs. Chris glared indignantly at the living commander, and then the latter shouted that they were mercenaries. Chris started to turn around as the commander shouted murderers or enemies. Chris flew out from behind the tent at high speed, and then he thought about how much it annoyed him. As he ran as fast as he could, the system message throwing skill 16 popped up in his head. Chris waved his hand in anger and shouted get lost. He ran to one of the tents. Then I went inside. An enemy soldier appeared in front of Chris. Chris looked at the soldier with a puzzled expression, and the soldier asked, what are you doing? The soldier glared at Chris, then said that they had been told that the enemy had infiltrated the unit. Chris looked at the soldier with a puzzled expression, then wondered why he had such an angry face. The soldier told Chris to pick up the gun faster. Chris said yes. The enemy commander, looking angrily at the soldier, shouted that they had found the attacker. Damn it. Suddenly, the tent behind the enemy commander along with his soldiers exploded. The commander turned around in fright and someone shouted at him general. An enemy soldier ran up to his general and said in a trembling voice that the enemy's troops. Canary fled with the soldiers. He raised his sword in the air and then shouted charge. The troops broke away. The soldier reported to his general that an enemy unit was advancing on them. The enemy general was looking ahead in fright and someone was shouting to put out the fire. Several of the enemy's terrified soldiers tried to escape from Kenry's rapidly approaching army. An enemy soldier, looking at the enemy army, shouted that they could not give up their lives, even at the cost of their lives. At the same time, Digo, in the uniform of enemy soldiers, cut off his head. The heads of the enemy soldiers flew off their shoulders, and the survivors shouted that there were spies in the enemy's squad. 
someone had cut open the head of an enemy soldier. It was Kennery, who had deftly stunned him at the beginning of one, and then killed the other. Kennery glared away. The enemy soldier, seeing him, was very frightened. Kennery walked quickly toward him, his brow furrowed. The enemy general was standing in the middle of a nightmare, holding his face, shouts were heard everywhere and fire was burning, he whispered that he could not believe his eyes. The enemy general held onto his terrified face as he whispered that how could this have happened? Someone called out to the general, who turned around in a puzzled manner. A soldier appeared in front of him, holding a horse on a leash, and shouted to hide. Chris looked around, and then thought that great, they already had the victory in their hands, only their commander was left to deal with. Suddenly Chris looked to the side and saw the enemy commander getting on his horse and shouting that it was a shame. Chris took out a small blade and then asked where. Chris threw the blade with great force and asked where the general was going. The blade caught the general in the back, and he swore from his horse. Chris frowned at him, then shouted that it wasn't deep. At the same time, an arrow flew at the general's head. Chris looked at the dead general with a puzzled expression. Lind was standing next to Chris, looking surprised and holding a bow. We are moved in the late afternoon, someone announces that today is my brother's. Kennery steps forward raising his sword and shouts to the cheering crowd that they have won. The soldiers cheer happily, Chris and Lind stand quietly and listen to Kennery. The soldiers cheerfully shout that they are drinking their fill tonight, they have every right to do so. Chris closes his eyes, and then it opens. He wakes up and pulls himself up inside the tent, then asks what he can do for a run. Chris rushes forward at high speed, and then suddenly it stops. He wipes after his face, then thinks that with this kind of training, the message doesn't pop up anymore. He remembers all the moments that have passed with him, and then they think that his skills have grown quite quickly thanks to these battles. And then he thought that now he could fight with his right hand, and everything had changed so much, both he and Lind and the 7th Infantry Regiment. Chris squeezes his hand with a smile and then wonders if everything will be different now. Ralph is standing on a hillock, shouting at the soldiers to run normally. Ralph smiles and then tells Chris that he is now also excused from training. Chris replies that he is glad to hear it, and then asks what is their training session together in the afternoon. Ralph, smiling, says yes and then shouts at the soldiers to turn up the nose of the 6th regiment. Chris turns around in a puzzled way in front of him is Gillen and says that it was a great battle tactic. He smiles and then goes on to say that their squad is completely different now, isn't it? Chris looks at Gillen with a smile and then says that he shouldn't have killed the commander. Gillen replies that he thinks it's a pity to lose your talent, looking at what they've been through. Gillen turns to Chris and listens intently, and Chris goes on to say that even if it's not for a good reason, Kenry is still a former knight, if he was a commander who was preparing for war, he would definitely become a knight. Gillen looks ahead and then says that of course anyone would be envious if he really is preparing for war, and then asks what he will show for today's training. Chris watched Gillen carefully, and then thought that he wasn't giving himself away, he was quite devious. Why is Gillen here, and why is he posing as a private? It's obvious that an illegitimate son cannot lead soldiers, so he avoids Count Van Ludwig's father, and his brothers too, in order to find talented people. Gillen started to walk away from Chris, saying that he was gone, and Chris looked at him and thought about how to take over their power later. Suddenly Chris had an idea, and he wondered if he could use experience to gain growth points. Chris turned to Gillen and asked if he would fight him. Chris furrowed his brow and thought that since Gillen had these abilities, he should try them out. Gillen turned to Chris, and Chris thought that he needed to test his strength. We are taken to an open clearing, Gillen standing in front of Chris. Chris examines Galena carefully, holding the spear in his hands. Suddenly Chris asks Gillen in a puzzled way if he will draw his sword. Gillen smiled and then said that Chris is a cheeky kid. Gillen's eyes lit up with a turquoise light, and he smiled menacingly and said that it was coming. A second later, Chris was flying sideways in fright. A system message appeared in his head that his experience points had increased, and he bent down and shouted that he didn't have a sword. Chris frowned at his nose and then said whether that was possible. Looking at the insanely scary Gillen coming at him, Chris wondered if it was a prophet. The ultimate goal, common to all warriors, is the final stage of throwing away humanity. Chris looked fearfully at Gillen approaching, and then thought that this is power, for him to understand, it is not available, Gillen asked what really Chris was afraid of. Chris pursed his lips, frowning menacingly, and wondered if that was why it made sense. Chris looked at Gillen's shining eyes, and then thought that in his previous life, he didn't even have the opportunity to get such an experience, he needed to give it his all. Chris lunged forward with his spear, a large number of system messages popped up in his head. Chris looked at Gillen carefully, and then thought that the closer he got to it, the more pressure there is, this is the limit, he doesn't believe it. Suddenly Gillen began to draw his sword from its scabbard. He took it out at high speed and swung it in front of Chris, and then he threw a couple of punches in front of him. Chris watched, startled, as blood spurted out. He was looking at his cut hands in four pieces. 
Then Gillen ripped open the man's body with great force. A stream of blood spurted from Chris, and Gillen's sword closed in again. Gillen held it close to Chris's throat. And then Chris woke up to Gillen slapping him on the head and telling him to stop and get up. Chris looked down at his hands, panting, and then wondered if all the pain had been his imagination. Chris glared at Gillen, then asked what he had done. Gillen shook his head indifferently, then said that there was something. And then he added that Chris should remain a private and a strategist. This is wisdom, Chris smiled and thought that in his previous life, he had heard about this. He remembered how they shouted at him to give it up already, no efficiency, better let him take up farming. What kind of swordsman is he, with such a build, let him go collect grass, Chris thought that everything is so bad for me alone. Chris barely got to his feet his body was shaking he turned to Gillen and asked that it was too early for him to throw a spear, Gillen, leaving smiling, replied that if he tried, the second-rate knight would pull it is not his. Chris raised a trembling fist to his face, a system message appeared in his head that the experience points were approaching the limit. He thought that he had made it, now he needed to rest, then he was a little too much, such a strain, just being around him, how strong he was. Digo looked at Chris with a puzzled expression, and then asked for an exemption from the joint training session. Chris, barely able to stand on his feet, asked if it was possible, then added that they still need leadership to command the positions. Digo said that he would report well. We are carried to the barracks, Chris is lying under a blanket, Pumpkin comes running to him. Chris' body continues to shake, Pumpkin comes up to him and licks his cheek, someone says that such clouds have gathered, then the training is cancelled. The first drop fell on the blade of grass, very soon. And then there was a heavy downpour, the next day, after training. Someone stepped loudly in a puddle on the day the rain came down. A couple of people were running in the pouring rain in green capes, and one of them shouted damn it. Two guards in blue armor were standing guard, one of them was displeased and asked why. Every time he guards the border it rains, his companion laughed. And then he added that the shift chain should be fixed soon, suddenly someone's hands appeared behind them. At the same time, two soldiers were stunned by the curse of the eighth gate, and the circa were incinerated. The masked man took out a small flask and opened it, virus. They opened the mouth of the stun guard and poured the contents of the flask inside, white demon. A pumpkin appears in front of us, drinking water. Chris pats her on the head, and then looking at her saying that lately, he was so busy that he couldn't keep an eye on her, and then Chris apologized to her. Lind came into the tent in a brown cape, and Chris looked at him and asked why they were helping out on the borders. Lind took off his hood and said yes, and then added that someone had attacked the guards, but they only lost consciousness and later woke up without any injuries. Chris gave Lind a startled look, and Lind added, isn't this weird? Suddenly, Lind opened the tent with a puzzled expression. Chris ran as fast as he could in the pouring rain, but he shouted at the wrong side of the trail to put on at least a raincoat and thought that everyone was doing nothing. Chris furrowed his brows and continued running, thinking about how in his previous life, this didn't extend to their squad, so he couldn't think that one action could change everything. Chris signed up for the tent and called out to pedal. Chris went inside and then said that he was the one who made up the border security work shifts, and he said that yes, he was currently making a plan for the next week. Chris approached Petal and then asked what the guards who were attacked yesterday were from. Petal said that they were from Ralph's Decurion. Chris looked down tensely, and then Petal went on to say that he was checking, no weird stuff, Chris didn't have to worry, there was no need to worry so much, rushing here without a raincoat. Chris, looking at the puzzled Petal, thought that even if it was Petal he would say that he would fight the curse, his attitude towards him might change. Chris closed his eyes and said with a deep sigh that he would borrow Petal's raincoat. Chris pushes aside the eyeball of one of the soldiers and sees black spots. Ralph, looking at Chris with a smile and asks that there is no problem, their guys are not so weak, Chris looking at the two soldiers thinks that the black spots on the eyeballs are the first symptoms. Chris turns to Ralph and says that if something happens, he should be the first to know about it, and Ralph says okay. White demon, having contracted this disease, your body will slowly become covered with frost, and then death due to such a symptom, this is more often called a curse than a disease. Chris remembers reading a book, and the girl told him that more than a hundred healers died trying to remove it, the first person to use this disease in battle was called. The girl responds angrily to Anskin Rizones, then adds that he should die a Cretan. The girl angrily goes on to say that this damn disease doesn't destroy all the healers of the bastard. Chris recalls how he picked herbs in the swamp, over time, they began to make new medicines, and such a concept as a curse change, the most important ingredient that is needed in the manufacture of the antidote Dirty Maiden, which he recently collected. Kazuyulia and Chris were sitting near the fire, Chris was stirring something with a stick in a pot, Kazuyulia was upset and asked if it was okay to eat it. Chris thought that you need to boil the dirty virgin in water, then you need to evaporate all the moisture, and in the resulting powder, you need to add well-grown leaves of blue grass, and thus the antidote will be ready. Suddenly, someone shouted very loudly at Chris, which scared him a lot. Chris turned around and saw Ralph holding the arm of a soldier, Ralph said that the soldier was tired badly. 
The soldier opened his mouth, and Chris thought that his teeth were turning black and his palate was blue, which was the middle stage. The soldier started coughing, Chris frowned bitterly, and added that the soldier should chew. The soldier behind Chris with a trembling voice said black teeth, blue sky Chris thought that this treatment is over, now we can only wait for the medicine to take effect. The upset soldier said that he had heard about it, Chris reflected that, however, the real problems would start now. A soldier standing in the middle of the barracks said that such symptoms are for sure. The white demon soldier shouted, and everyone in the barracks immediately turned around. Chris, closing his eyes in frustration and thinking that he knew it, Ralph turned to the soldier and asked what the white demon was. Soldier, frowning and what to tell, that this is a curse that came from the mountain ranges covered with snow, and if you get infected, you will inevitably die, Ralph worried asked that it's quite a long way from here. The soldier is sure of it. The soldier recalled the terrible events and replied that it wasn't the distance, the small town of Trisidian Circa, then the soldier was suddenly shouted that he was completely destroyed by this disease. Digo turned warily to Chris, and then, holding a torch in his hands, he said that they should burn them alive, so let everyone move away. Ralph, hearing this, asked Grozny what it was, and then asked him to repeat it. Ralph grabbed Digo by the scruff of the neck, and Digo shouted that he was saying that they should be burned now, absolutely all of them, otherwise this curse would spread throughout the squad. Docky came up behind Ralph and grabbed Ralph by the clothes, and Ralph glared at Digo and then said that all right, they'd see what he said after he knocked out his teeth. Ralph glared at Digo and then shouted at Chris that rioting was such a hobby for their squad. Docky frowned at Ralph and shouted that maybe he would take his hands off. Digo the commander shouted. Chris calmly pointed ahead, and Digo shouted for Chris to get away from the sick man. Chris asked the patient to lower his eye. He thought that the black spots on the eyeballs disappeared. Someone asked Commander Ralph to calm down. Digo furiously shouted at Chris that he had told him to get out of there. Lynn turned to Chris and said that he thought it would be better for him to be with him for a while. A soldier entered the tent, holding on his shoulder his comrade, who was in a bad state. He shouted to the commander that it was a private. Everyone turned around in fright. Digo picked up the torch after hearing the words that the private is also bad. Chris turned menacingly and ordered Digo to put the torch away. Kaziulia and Lynn grabbed Digo, shouting for him to stop. The torch fell from Digo's hand. Digo screamed furiously. He pushed aside his companions. Chris frowned at Digo, and then Digo grabbed the spear. He left it on Chris and shouted that if Chris didn't move away, he would go from words to actions. Ralph on the cliff shouted in his teeth that Digo was a bastard. He was stopped by the fighters to hold on. Chris, looking at the angry Digo, wondered if he had lost his mind, why it had come to this. Chris held out his hands and said that he would stand back, but let Digo and them lower their weapons. Digo lowered his spear, breathing heavily. Chris dropped to his knees, then whispered faster. He immediately put out his hand. Then he snatched the spear from Digo. Digo turned around, puzzled, and Chris shouted faster. Kaziulia and his companions rushed to Digo. Chris shouted for everyone to grab him. Digo was lying on the ground, shouting furiously at Chris. All of a sudden, the tent burst open and someone said, What the hell is going on here? Kennery came into the tent, frowning, and the Kennery leader called out to him. Chris looked at Kennery with a puzzled expression, and Kennery asked Ralph to explain, but Ralph couldn't answer. And then Kennery looked at Chris, who looked startled. Chris, looking at the soldiers who were eating the medicine, wondered what went from fire to flame. Kennery told Chris to step aside. Chris furrowed his brows, then said menacingly that he wouldn't let them be killed. Kennery, looking calmly at Chris, replied that he would not repeat it again, and asked Chris to step aside again. Chris desperately shouted that it was just a common disease and it could be cured, let them believe him. Kennery looked at Digo with interest, who was still shouting that Chris wasn't in his right mind, that he was crazy. Digo, lying on the floor in tears, shouted that Chris Commander had gone mad, so they shouldn't listen to what he was saying. Kennery asked who the guy was, and Chris calmly said he was from the scouting squad. Digo kept shouting at the soldiers that they had to be burned or they would all die. Tears streamed down Digo's cheeks as he shouted that he knew more about this curse than anyone else. Digo shouted furiously, with the last of his strength, that he was from Terrazidi. Chris gave Digo a puzzled look and then said that being a survivor of Trezine was why he was like that. Lind and Kaziulia tried to restrain Digo, but he continued to desperately shout that it was a curse as soon as the first corpse appeared, the disease could not be stopped, they should now burn them. Chris looked at Kennery and said he knew how to treat it. Digo, with tears in his eyes, continued to shout furiously that Chris he had lost his entire family, he didn't know a damn thing. Ralph hit Digo on the neck who shouted Commander hurry, and then Ralph told him to get some rest. Kennery put his hand out in front of Chris and said that from now on, let him not go against orders, and then added let him go with him. Chris frowned, thinking that Kennery's taking Digo's side was probably a bad thing. Chris, watching Kennery leave, thought that he had to convince him at all costs, if they started slaughtering their comrades, then all the fighting spirit would be lost, and then the answer was obvious. 
Chris suddenly grabbed Kennery's clothes and spoke again. He whispered to the puzzled Kennery that he didn't want to be a knight again. Kennery turned around, startled, and shouted something. Chris calmly continued to whisper that he didn't think it would be easy, though. Kennery stopped and continued listening, Chris said, especially for someone who had an affair with the king's wife. Chris went on to say that he knows what to do, a feat that anyone will recognize. He would help him, let Kennery believe him. Kennery stared ahead in silence. Ego started to open his eyes. The first thing Ono saw was Kazuya happily sitting in front of him and saying that Digo was finally awake. Digo jumped out of bed and then shouted Chris. It was hard to breathe and Kazuya asked with a smile if he had calmed down. Digo took off and Kazuya thought that it looked like he wasn't there yet. Digo went outside and opened the tent. What he saw startled him. Ralph was standing in front of him, hugging the early ailing fighters and shouting that he was worried about them. Digo opened his mouth, puzzled. He looked at one of the fighters and then said that they really found a way to treat it. From the white demon, startled, he said, damn it, how? Suddenly, a hand was placed on Digo's back. He looked at the previously ill fighters with a smile and said that he had said the same thing. Digo called Chris. He watched Chris walk away, puzzled. We are taken to a tent where Kenry and Chris are standing in front of the table, Chris says that they are completely cured, Kennery says that this is great, we need to make a temporary hospital, and find infected people from other units. Kennery looks at Chris carefully, then says that they are in the 7th Infantry, Chris says that he understands. We are taken to the tent where Chris and Kazila are preparing an antidote, and in the afternoon, several patients came to them. Chris and his companions set them up in a separate place. Chris and the others looked at each of you carefully, and for three days they treated them. Chris came out of the tent with a heavy sigh and said that it was finally over, now he needed to get some air. Suddenly, a fighter ran up to Chris and took his hand and shouted Savior. Chris smiled as the fighter shouted Long Live Our Savior. There were a lot of people on the street, all cheering for Chris, shouting that they had defeated the curse, and the prize thought that this was too much. Kennery walked up to Chris and asked him who he really was, and Chris turned around, puzzled. Then he smiled and said that he was just a tired soldier right now. Tannery asks if this is true and crosses his arms to tell Chris to answer it like it is. Chris, sitting at the table, says that this is so, the 8th Gate surely accepted their offer for a good way to attack, they should immediately start preparing. Kennery, sitting at the table with Petal, said that he would have to pass on the order, Chris agreed with him and said that he would prepare his trap. And then Chris told Lin to gather a squad of archers, Lin agreed. Chris turned to look at the goat. Then he told him to gather some dry logs, smiled, and said he understood. Late at night, Chris was walking through the woods with Digo and Kazulia, and Kazulia said that it was raining last night, so it would be difficult to find dry branches. Cross put his hand on his face and then thoughtfully said damn. Digo looked at Chris and turned to him saying that if he and for him any work. Chris, looking ahead, wondered what to do, they needed as much wood as possible. All of a sudden, he remembered the cart he was using to transport supplies. And then he turned to Digo and asked where the cart of eight lie that they robbed, Digo answer, inside the tent. Chris put his hand on Digo's shoulder and replied that it was fine, let Digo destroy this cart, Digo replied understood. He immediately ran to the side and shouted that he would grind her to powder, and Chris shouted after him that he shouldn't do that. Lind held a torch in his hand while standing near a large number of planks and meat said that they had lit the fire. The forest began to burn with a bright flame that the meat is lost. Chris, looking at the fire, said that when black smoke comes from the meat, the enemy will think that they are burning their comrades, Kazuya. Looking at the fire, replied that it is still a pity for the meat, Chris thought that they will probably think that their squad is in a real panic. The enemy soldiers were standing not far behind the forest, they saw black smoke, Chris thought that they would not miss this opportunity. The flames burned brighter and brighter. The enemy soldiers were slowly closing in on him. The soldiers drew their swords and marched in a steady line toward the smoke and then one of them shouted, attack, and they took off. The enemy soldiers quickly ran towards the smoke, shouting that the enemy was in a panic, they had to destroy everyone. The soldier opened his mouth wide and shouted forward. Suddenly, he stepped on the ground, and it began to sink in. The enemy soldier watched as his comrade began to disappear into the ground. A large number of soldiers fell into the cliff. They started shouting in fright that they were traps. Kennery, looking menacingly ahead, shouted to the squad of archers, fire. A huge number of arrows were approaching the enemy units. And then the soldiers who fell into the trap were hit by a hail of arrows. The soldiers watched helplessly as they were shot one by one. Chris, along with his friends, armed with a sword, rushed into battle. The enemy soldiers looked around in fright and shouted that the enemy was on the right and left as well. The enemy soldier shouted that they were backing up, everyone should leave. The enemy soldiers stared ahead in fear, unable to do anything. They shouted that they were surrounded, the enemy soldiers were trapped in a huge trap. One of the enemy knights collides with his weapon with an allied soldier. After that, the enemy knight still manages to kill the allied soldier with one blow, 
while he screams in pain and starts to bleed all over. And the enemy soldiers, all three of them, in a bunch, turn to each other and shout that they should keep their eyes open and there are not so many of them, but they can climb from everywhere. They need to hold out until help arrives. After that, the allied knight looks at the enemy soldier who is about to attack him, while smoke rises everywhere. He stares ahead in surprise at this enemy soldier as he attacks him covered in blood and yells about how these youngsters are going to destroy them. This soldier tries to protect with his hands by closing his eyes and curling up. At this point, the attacking enemy soldier pierces the weapon from behind, hitting him on the torso and passing through. A soldier with a black beard comes up to him and asks in surprise if he is alright, and he stammers, says yes, thank you. After that, this allied soldier comes up and is hit by an arrow right in the body, while he tries to say that you need to get up and leave quickly because it's dangerous here. He watches as the man who just walked in front of him after being hit by an arrow falls to the ground, and he opens his mouth in surprise. He throws down his spear and starts crying putting his hands to his face and saying that it's all his fault and it's his fault. He keeps crying, everyone keeps yelling at him about what he's doing. Chris comes over and grabs him, looking him straight in the face and yelling that he needs to come to his senses. And it's a battlefield. He looks directly at Chris as he talks about how he'll continue to whine like a baby and if he survives, he'll be able to see his family. And isn't he right? Chris looks directly at the knight, who is very confused. At the same time, he is surprised, he falls silent and remembers his seven before as a woman stands near the house with a child. Calling them family, this soldier stands up, grabs his weapon, and runs in the opposite direction, starting to scream as Chris watches him. He also gets up and starts looking around, thinking to himself that the enemy is stronger than he thought, and will he be able to hold out until the 5th infantry arrives. Looking out over the battlefield, we see fire appearing everywhere, arrows stuck in the ground and enemy knights killing allied troops clearly dominating. He thinks to himself that they will definitely win this battle. The main thing is to force the enemy to retreat. After that, one open work of all sorts of troops goes forward, and Chris, striking a dagger from behind, says that first you need to start with those in uniform. And the two soldiers standing next to them notice that their commander is starting to breathe heavily and clutching his neck. And they realize that he is dead and shout to all the other soldiers. They say that the commander was killed. And Chris, walking forward with a red badge on his shoulder, thinks about what he should do now, after which the severed heads of enemy soldiers fly everywhere. He stands up and stares at them as he lowers his head to the floor, and he says great they are confused. And then he turns around and looks very surprised to the side. He wonders what's wrong, and he looks at his commander as he continues to attack the many enemy troops while they surround him. And the commander stood up in surprise while steam emanated from his ball. He is very surprised and thinks to himself that this time he is too late. If only he had understood a little earlier. He looks at these knights that he hit with what are now huge scratches on their helmets from his weapons. They smile and head forward, and the commander thinks to himself, why are they only defending themselves? He thinks, are they really waiting for them to be exhausted? And calmly looks ahead, and thinks that he has feelings, and it is somehow strange. After that, the commander hears sounds from behind and notices, turning around, how they fly away from there. Multiple allied knights, cut up. He starts to peer and sees a huge man raise his blade up, killing one of them. The men have a large gray beard and short hair. He strikes at one of the soldiers, after which another warrior standing next to him, covered in blood, fell to his knees and almost cried, looking at how killed his ally, and he stammered that he had cut him to pieces while his body was being torn apart. After that, while this knight is trying to approach him, he turns around and shouts that it is a monster, trying to escape. And the captain notices, then shouts that everyone was leaving here. And at that moment, one of the knights he was trying to attack was only defending himself, attacks him, and the captain manages to defend him with his weapon. This knight in red with a scar on his helmet says where he's going, starts to smile. After that, the captain notices how the other knight begins to attack him. For him, both attack directly at the commander while he tries to defend against it, thinking to himself that they were waiting for help. I thought to myself that it was bad, that no one else in the squad would be able to deal with the monster. He tries to fight off two soldiers who attacked him, and thinks about how he hears the screams of their troops, and they stopped. And did someone get into a fight with him? He turns his eyes to see who it was. He notices Chris standing right in front of the knight, looking up as the knight lowers his head to see Chris. The commander is very surprised that it was Chris, who pulls his spear forward and is clearly worried. He thinks to himself that it's definitely the pressure that makes his skin crawl. Chris looks directly at this knight, who is looking at him seriously and with his whole appearance, shows that he is in trouble. Chris thinks to himself that there is no doubt that his level will match that of a knight. And this knight, they say, letting off steam from his mouth, and says M boy, he's not bad if he's already in uniform at that age. 
and this knight starts to bend down, get into a crouch and say let's see, then attacks Chris directly, telling him what he did so well, while Chris stands surprised and doesn't understand what's going on. After the director made a dash for Chris, he still manages to evade him with the help of his spear, which was almost cut open. The knight looks him straight in the face and says that's how we have a commander, okay. And while Chris tries to fend off his strong attack, after all, Chris is clearly inferior in strength. The knight says we'll see how much longer he can stand. And he continues to attack Chris blow by blow, telling him that he really is a good kid. And while Chris is defending himself, his system shows that his experience points have increased. Chris continues to defend himself until his entire spear becomes unusable, and it is given to him very hard. He can barely keep up and thinks to himself that he should not have blocked the attack now and his body is not listening. After that, an arrow flies at this knight, and Chris thinks to himself that the enemy is really strong and we need to figure out what to do. And then, while the knight's arrow is flying, he managed to break it with his sword. He starts to turn to the person who launched the arrow, and he sees Lind in front of him. He is standing in the middle of the fire, far away from the knight of light, and they are both looking at him. Feeling awkward, Lind pulls out another arrow. The knight starts running straight towards him with all his might, while Chris yells at Lind to get out of here. Chris realizes this and starts to turn around. And Chris, who has been watching all this, thinks to himself that he is asking to use all the luck and not come to him. At this moment, someone bursts out of the fire right at the dock of this knight. He turns to see who it is, and he sees Diego in front of him, running along with a shield and shouting as he attacks with a spear. He manages to injure the knight's legs and run forward. After which, while this knight is standing in shock, Diego asks Chris if the commander is okay. Chris, turning around, says that thanks to him until the experience is over, they are panting and worried. Digo and Mima stood beside the knight, and Chris said he dropped the spear and took the shield. After that, he reflected that from now on, they were the defense and he was the attack. Chris and Digo were surrounded by fire along with the knight. She holds a spear pointed at this soldier while Digo stands with his shield. This soldier has lowered his sword, looking at them. Chris turns directly to Digo. He tells him that he should be careful, because he is a knight. This knight raises his weapon, standing in a crouch all pumped up and with a grey beard. He wonders who they think he is, unless the two of them can beat him. Then he looks at Chris and Digo and yells that he's going to tear everyone to pieces while smoke rises from the fire everywhere. After which, the knight's leg starts to bleed. He notices it when he looks at her and thinks he's overdoing it. After that, this knight attacks with his ball from above, and Chris notices this and shouts to Digo to defend himself with his shield. Digo takes the hit, hard, his body shifting to his shield. And watching this Chris thinks to himself with surprise that there is no such power comparable to what was before. And he yells at him to hold the bar tight and grab him. After that, this knight looks at Chris and attacks him, saying that how much noise he makes and he will die first. Digo then successfully defends himself with the shield, while the knight's sword pierces the shield, slicing it open. And Chris, standing behind him with the spear, thinks to himself that for now he's deflecting the blow. Chris stabs with his spear, thinking that it will penetrate the knight, but he manages to defend with his sword, blocking the blow. This knight is surprised by this and thinks to himself that hell, even though his spear looks very weak, he can fight back. And Chris continues to attack with a golden glow in his eyes, thinking that he's also losing. Judging by the angle of the attack, he's aiming for the chest. And the knight keeps watching, looking away, thinking, what then? After that, he shouts that Dago will start and hits him, and he flies away with his shield. They scream in pain. This knight becomes very angry, saying that how dare he stand in the way of the wolf knight starts attacking with his sword, while Digo defends himself with his shield, which is already beginning to crack and collapse. Chris shouts clearly worried, saying that he can't do it anymore, after which this cheat is destroyed into small pieces by a strong blow from the knight from above. And Chris, who is watching, walks up to the knight's back. The knights smile as they watch the wood chips fly away, and he thinks about what he did, and now he will open it. After that, Chris is hit by a blow, injuring his cheek. Chris thinks to himself, holding the spear in a bad state thinking that he took it on purpose, because it turned out to be useful, thinking that the enemy doesn't know, because initially. And Chris lands a punch right at the knight's head before he turns and spots the spear. Speaking of which, he was right-handed after all. Grease manages to grab this spear before the tip reaches it, and he thinks to himself that he's probably aiming for the head. After which, he punches Chris, knocking the spear away with him, thinking about his left hand. And after all the dust settles, Chris looks down at his left arm and notices that it's all broken and twisted. The knight shouts that Chris is a bad person with a wounded eye and is going to attack him. Digo shouts at him that he doesn't, looking ahead, and sees his arm heal, exuding a green color. He stands rooted to the spot, watching the system issue notifications, thinking about what the artifact is. He manages to evade the knight's heavy punch by running behind him while dust rises everywhere. He thinks of his body as light as a feather, then picks up the spearhead. 
taking it in his left hand, he thinks that it has recovered, and Chris manages to land a kick on the knight's leg as he tries to turn around, gritting his teeth in pain and sitting up on his knees. He shouts at Chris that he's a scumbag and tries to hit him with his elbow, while Chris gets close and tries to defend himself from the elbow strike. This knight looks at him in surprise with one remaining eye. So far, the wounded man is covered in blood, thinking that because of his left knee, he can't fight at full strength. After which, the knight notices, looking up, that Chris appears right on top of his body. He sticks his piece of spear right into his shoulder, hold everything by jumping on the knight. Digo watches all this while he has blood on his lips with great surprise, shouting at him. Then the commander in the heat of battle, standing about two corpses bleeding, turns to their battle. And Chris is standing over the body of a knight who is falling down with a spear stuck in his shoulder. And before her, he shouts about how he defeated the enemy, while Chris wipes off the sweat with his hand, looking at this work. The commander goes to them all shabby and says, how did he manage all this? While Digo smiles and says that the commander of the 5th infantry has arrived. After that, many soldiers on horseback come forward, led by a man who has a black beard. They shout that they were able to win. Their commander with long hair is approached by a bald man with a black beard, standing right in front of him. He says that he is the leader of infantry regiment number 5, telling the commander that an order has come from above, right now he is collecting all positions to go to the main unit. After that, the commander says that he understood everything by looking at him, and he sees a knight lying on the floor with a piece of spear stuck in it. Speaking of which, was he the one who killed their leader? After that, the commander says that no, it's not true, and someone else killed him, and Chris holding up and helping walk up to her to listen. Speaking of which, one of the commanders came. He looks forward in surprise and thinks to himself that such a young guy was able to handle a wolf knight. And Chris, when he comes up, says that his name is Chris and he is a scout of the 7th infantry. After that, the commander looks at him and says that really he is joking and no matter how happy he is about the victory, to which he is told that this is true, standing in front of him. And Chris thinks to himself that he's already used to this reaction. After that, in the afternoon, a carriage rides through the forest. Three Chris and his entire squad are sitting up and asleep and Lind holds up Chris's rag, saying that Commander Petal said to give him this trophy. Chris smiles at Lind. He tells him that he's fixed something, it's a little too much for him, but he's very happy, by extending your hand forward. Then he closes his eyes and thinks about how happy he really is, and when he opens them, he says that in a previous life, he looks at his entire squad, who are resting in the carriage, and he thinks that he was not capable of anything and just used people with outstanding skills, keeping them on his side as protection. After that, he makes a serious face, his eyes start to burn golden and thinks about what, but now everything is different, he doesn't want to stand aside and wants these guys to stay with him, because he doesn't want that. Past life. Then Pumpkin comes up to him and barks at Chris. He smiles and reaches out to pat her, saying yes, Pumpkin, and so does he. After that, the commander shows them not to get out of the carriage, and they begin to get out. Chris walks next to the commander, looking at him and asking, where are they going? And then the serious one, going ahead, says that they are going to the third ode. And Chris thinks to himself that there are one, two and three. He sings along to the curtain, looking at the commander and thinks to himself that they will finally see them, because they are the best commanders and chief of the army. Thinking that before the outbreak of the white demon disease, he didn't go anywhere outside of the squad will decide what to do now. Then they enter the tent where the other commander and chief is standing. They see a man sitting on a red chair with long golden hair and a black mustache. He crosses his arms, and Chris says it's Baron Van Ludwig's eldest son Vihin Ludwig. The Baron's son stays in his chair, smiling and saying that he is really serious. After all, the one who killed the Wolf Knight was this boy. He watches as Chris and the series commander kneel in front of him and tells them that so, since all the main characters are here, he wants to announce. He looks directly at them and says that he recognizes all the exploits of the 7th Infantry Regiment. He says that Mr. Commander also certifies the unofficial rank of commander of a detachment of 500 people. After that, he bowed down to him and told him to thank him, close his eyes. Chris looks at all this and thinks to himself that it's too late for an official title and he understands. After that, the Baron's son calls Chris to him and he is surprised to say that yes, the commander. He looks at Chris and says that he thanks him for defeating the White Demon and the leader of the Eight Gates. Chris looks at him in surprise as he tells him that he is being assigned as the commander of a 100-man squad. After that, the Baron's son tells him to let him put on his shoulder straps with his own hands. Chris looks up in surprise and says that, of course, this is a great honor for him. The Baron's son then puts the shoulder straps on Chris's shoulders while he stands still with a serious face. He takes him right by the shoulder in his black gloves. He smiles as he brings his face right up to Chris and tells him that he looks even younger up close and doesn't accidentally need anything. And Chris thinks to himself, very self-consciously, that it's definitely his orientation. 
He kneels down in front of the Baron's son again, looking him in the eye, and tells him that when they attack the enemy positions, he learned something. He says that Eight Gates is raising some special soldiers. After which, he is surprised by this, I ask, what kind of special soldiers? And Chris reminisces about his past life, thinking about what is true, unfortunately. He is not aware of all the details that he has heard that these are elite marines who come to special training for 10 years. He remembers them as a huge crowd gathered, they have burning red eyes, and they are fully dressed in armor with their helmets covering their faces. Speaking of which, there are about 10,000 of them. It seems that some of them were in the partisan detachment. After that, the Baron's son sits down on his chair and somehow does not seem surprised to say what he is driving at. And Chris, as he says all this, thinks to himself that what he is driving at is clearly not at all friendly with the head. And Chris tells him that if there is a hidden elite unit of fighters, it is more likely to be used as a guerrilla unit to target the heart of the Allied army. And the Baron's son smiles, looks at Chris, leans in a little, saying that in other words, they want to kill him and start laughing, saying that this is absurd. He goes on to say that their army has the best cavalrymen on the entire continent, and no matter how strong the enemy of their army is, they will defeat them as soon as they see them. And Chris keeps telling him with a serious face that it will be difficult to get into a fight in a messy fight with colorists. Knowing the enemy's intentions, it's not like they can just expose them to attack. Isn't he right? After that, the fairy starts to get angry and ask him if he really decided to teach him now. And Chris bows to him think to yourself that he was wrong and was too bold. He tells him that he is also sorry for the trouble and only wants the master's well-being. After which, the Baron looks away into his eyes, smiling and extending his hand, saying that he forgives him. And Chris thinks to himself, as he looks up, that all you have to do is please him, saying that he has a plan to put an end to this war in two days, and he asks him to listen to him, then you can teach him a lesson. And the Baron's son is surprised by this, smiles and says that it's good, let him tell him, and he will personally teach him a lesson. And Chris imagines all this, as a lot of carriages on different paths go straight to the houses. It is said that they are thinking about a surprise attack on the eight-gate transport routes. He says that, in truth, the enemy wants to end the war before winter begins, and if there is any mishap during transportation, they will mobilize hidden partisan detachments and try to finish the battle in a hurry. After that, Foam Rubber looks at Chris in surprise and says how he is going to fight back against their partisans. And Chris, looking at the Baron's son with confidence, says that they should gather a hundred fighters and organize an elite unit. If they manage to defeat the partisan unit, they will again undermine the morale of the enemy and victory will be in their hands. Two days later, the world is walking right on the grass. He and Dig are standing right on the field, watching the many carriages coming down the road. He looks at the commander and says that they are indeed here and, as Chris said, the guard of this route is useful. The captain says that, and shouts to the whole army behind him, raising his hand forward, that they should not forget about their goal and go to the attack. After that, a lot of allied troops dressed in blue armor run straight to the enemy carts. While those in a stupor are surprised, they do not understand what is happening. They are shouting that there's been a surprise attack and the captain resolves two of them to head off with one of his punches. After that, all the carriages are on fire. One of the allied knights plunges his spear directly into the neck of the opponent while he screams in pain and blood spurts from him. Digo, clearly confused, then tells the commander that they are done while he is delivering his blow, and the commander replies that he clearly heard the shout from afar. And enemy troops wearing helmets are standing around burning carriages. He tells another soldier that the enemy is retreating, and they wonder why they are retreating and what the fuck. After that, all the soldiers say that it all happened, watching as all the carriages with provisions burn, and the knights shout that their wares and their horses. After that, there are trees everywhere during the day. Chris is standing on one of the wastelands, leaning on his spear, rubbing his hands together. He thinks to himself that it's great that his left hand is no longer a problem. This is twirling his spear with his left hand and thinking that this is how he needs to think about the artifact now. He thinks he has realized that through training and real fights, he will be able to level up his skills. After which, he recalls the battle with those knights and how his arm was cured afterwards by him, cut his leg and eventually jumped on top of him, killing him. Speaking of which, he's only concerned about one thing, experience points. And he thinks that the day he fought that night, hearing that his body was dumped on the construction site, suddenly changed. After which, Chris stands with his spear pointed forward and thinks that the difference in reaction speed is like being tired by a different person. And it turns out that he has unusual abilities when skill points are suitable for certain conditions. He looks up at the sky and thinks that if this is the case, then he can do it too. He remembers himself in a previous life and, looking ahead, says that is really going to show him the art of possession of the ball. And what did he mean by the word talent? And while Chris sits and watches a man with long hair and only one left hand, 
while the latter is holding his sword in front of him and telling him that it is quite difficult to explain in words. After that, he takes a piece of wood with one hand and says that, for example, he throws it into the air, looking at it and holding a weapon. Then Chris looks at the piece of wood, and Chris is very surprised by what he sees. He watches as the man begins to spin his weapon, creating a huge air flow. Then this piece of wood falls to the ground, and the man manages to cut it into several parts in flight. Chris continues to watch as this piece of wood falls down, after which, he notices that it has been cut into many pieces. And while Chris watches in surprise as the piece of wood falls, the man says that in his understanding of talent, the ability to see something like this and immediately be able to repeat. And he asks him if his brave left-handed man can do it. Then he raises the blade to himself, looking at it and smiling, and says that, in general, this is a skill. Chris comes back from his memories and picks up a piece of wood. Looking at her, he thinks that the current him. Then he tosses it up and it spins in the air as he looks at it. He gets ready and thinks about the fact that he has mastered the talent, and then begins to spin the spear. It creates a huge amount of airflow and raises dust. He directs it forward and thinks that it is something that in a previous life he might not have dreamed of. He pierces a piece of wood that flies past him and looks at it with a smile, thinking that now he can do it. Then he grabs his fist and looks at it with a smile. Lind comes out from behind a tree. He looks at Chris and asks him what he's doing and that he's practicing his tricks. Chris raises his spear and looks at it, saying something like skill. After that, in the military camp, where there are many tents, many troops gather in huge columns. And at each column stands their leader, standing at the aisle. And Chris looks at one of the men who is shouting at everyone to come here and thinks about how everyone is very busy forming squads right now. After which, the man turns to Chris and says, he gathered a young commander of his squad. And Chris turns to him with a smile and a laugh, saying that he's already finished. While he is very surprised, and Chris, along with his friend, goes ahead, paying attention to this and saying that he has support from the outside. After that, this commander turns away and says that he pisses him off. Lind looks at Chris and asks him what he's talking about, what kind of support he has from the outside. Chris closes his eyes and says with a smile that he has one well-to-do dad. And Gillen is standing there looking at Chris, smiling at him and telling him that Chris really wants him to start a squad with the four of them. He starts laughing, playing, that he's always talking about something impossible. Chris looks at Gillen in surprise and says how impossible it is, while Gillen tries to tell him that it's not that hard. However, does he want him to do it for nothing? Chris asks him what his gold needs, and Gillen looks at him and says that when the battle is over, he must come to him. Chris is surprised by this, looking at him and saying that if he does so, there won't be a place to go. And Gillen, smiling, looks at it, they tell him not to worry and it will appear soon. Chris gathers all his supporters on the field. And he looks at them and says that today they train as usual. After that, Lin shoots a bow and it is said that he sets a target and shoots. After that, the three of them move straight to the goal, running towards the log. And Doki approaching the target and distracted by striking. After that, Chris strikes the log with his spear and Digo ends up with his shield. They say that they come out from the rear and finish. And he thinks that they should move as one because this is a simple but precise tactic that they have been practicing for four days. Who looks at Chris and asks if this will definitely work because he believes him, but the waste was taken away from the military area due to injuries. Now there were only four of them left, and Chris smiles and looks at him and tells him not to worry. He continues to watch and wonders if someone will follow the 15-year-old boy who was unofficially appointed commander of the 100-man squad, thinking that now the most important thing is to show yourself only to those who are in the main forces. After that, one of the men shouts that Attention Gate 8 has begun to act. And Chris notices this, thinking that it looks like the attack on the enemy's supplies was successful. I am one of the soldiers with a helmet and mustache shouting for them to run into battle. The son of a baron, dressed in armor and sitting on a horse next to the captain. He smiles as the huge cavalry stands next to him, spears raised in the air. On the opposite side, the enemy commanders stand with their cavalry. One of them is gray in blue armor, and two with black hair and a mustache in gold armor. A huge number of soldiers lined up next to each other, standing in front of each other. Chris stands with his companions near a large number of soldiers, and Digo is very surprised, looking at the entire battlefield. Lind also looks at the battlefield with Chris and asks about the fact that there are about 3,000 of them. Chris says it is, and one of the captains comes up to them and asks why there are only four of them while they're standing together, and Chris freaks out and says they're bringing up the rear. This captain starts to smile, looking at Chris, they say that even the wounded soldiers among them are similar, they were in a very big hurry. And Chris was standing there, thinking to himself that this was a hopeless situation for them. After that, a knight with a spear and a helmet standing nearby smiles while the other prays. He says you don't have to squeeze Epic's spear so hard did you put it in his pants. And the knight in front turns back and says that whoever is talking, 
because they will look again, he will soon become his superior. While a nearby soldier prays, saying that God will protect him, he begs for it. Chris stands and watches the enemy troops, thinking to himself that there were only 100 of them in the 7th Infantry Squad, and now they have entered the battlefields. Chris picked up the spear and held it up, watching and thinking to himself that nothing had changed, that they were fighting and defending and conquering. Then a man with a black mustache shouts that the whole army is on the attack. After that, a lot of allied and enemy troops start running forward, while those shouted out to them to go forward. They clashed with each other, fighting with swords and spears, killing each other, and screaming for them to die. So far, they've been screaming in pain. Chris turns to Digo and tells him to back up and they'll be out of the squad for a while. After that, the cavalrymen come forward on their armored horses, and a lot of enemy soldiers from below are trying to escape and defend themselves from them, saying that they need to be exterminated. And a few knights standing nearby are smiling as they watch the cavalrymen. One of them says that here is the squad, and they smile and say that since the battle is taking place on the plain, the circa riders will win. And one of the warriors who said that smiles and cuts him open. Another notices this, and they see the enemy army coming right up to them in a huge crowd and killing them cutting with the ball and punching with the spear, and one of the enemy captains glares angrily and walks forward while there is a huge scar on his forehead. He runs with the most in front, holding a huge blade and shouting to everyone to advance from here and block everyone. After that, he jumps directly at the enemies from above and deals a huge blow, killing several people. The force of his blow sends up plumes of smoke everywhere, and the soldiers are screaming in pain. After that, this captain shouts to everyone, being in the smoke, that we need to go to Faulties. After all, it's time to show the enemy a real horror. After that, Chris watches it all until there's blood on his face and neck. He thinks the atmosphere on the battlefield has changed and these types have appeared. He looks at his allies in the back and tells them to prepare to advance. After that, it presents everything in the form of how their squad falls between the 8-gate squad and the 7 squad. In the direction of 1-0, an enemy partisan detachment is located. They will make a detour and attack from behind. After that, while the partisans fight their way forward, killing many soldiers on the way and raising a huge fuss, one of the knights standing behind turns to the baron. He is very surprised and obviously frightened, says stammeringly that it seems that an enemy partisan detachment has appeared. After that, the baron's son was very surprised by this and began to worry, while the captain sitting next to him was shouting at everyone to let out an elite unit to attack. And the enemy squad of partisans is moving forward, killing one by one blowing their heads off their shoulders. Not a single one of them was smiling until his entire face was smeared with blood. He says it's ridiculous and goes on to say that they are going to stop the troops in such a way. After which, he gets angry and tells them that they will show them what the difference is in their powers. They continue to cut down the allied army, killing one by one and creating a huge ruckus, kicking up dust everywhere and sweeping away enemies. And many of this squad starts to smile, being in helmets and walking forward already pretty dirty, they say that they are just weaklings. And one of them says that you can quickly defeat them, because they will be the heroes of this war. After that, an arrow flies at one of them, and he manages to block it by raising his hand. At this point, Doki successfully runs right up to the enemy and strikes with his axes, stunning them and he's trying to come to his senses when Chris and Digo appear right behind him, shouting at them who they are. Chris manages to land a spear strike along with Dig, who is covering himself with a shield. Chris is very surprised to say that they deflected all the arrows that they shot, and these guys are a real elite, everyone will be careful when they shoot. Eigenen confirms this with a serious face. Doki then swings his axe straight at his hands and knocks the blade out of his hands. At the same time, Chris and Dig deal two blows to the enemy's neck and torso, thinking that they will not miss. Lin then draws an arrow and says that he checked only 50 people in the enemy squad. Lin then looks at them as they run forward, attacking and saying that they are launching a swift attack and they must kill them one at a time. While a huge battle is unfolding everywhere, kicking up all the dust and creating clumps of dust from which Lish Sility can be seen. And at this moment, while the commander of their squad is crushing everyone in his path, one of the enemy troops standing behind him is covered in blood, notices something from behind and shouts to the commanders that there is a similar problem in the rear. The commander, in turn, continues to go forward, already stained with blood, gritting his teeth, they say that they don't care, and let him leave them and continue to move forward while the knight turns to him and listens. At this point, Doki lands a blow with the axe, hitting him squarely on the neck. The commander notices, looking at them all covered in blood. At the same time, Chris, along with Dig, strikes with a spear, hitting the enemy directly. Lind fires an arrow, hitting the soldier standing behind Chris, while he kills one of them. And the commander goes further and further, cutting the allied soldiers in two. He smiles and holds his blade covered in blood and says that they will be the heroes of this battle and attack to attack. Then he notices something unusual and starts looking around. 
he turns around, sees a lot of corpses of allied troops behind him, and, worried, says that these are his wars. And while Chris is covered in blood and pulls his spear from one of the soldiers, he picks it up and wants to go ahead. He's breathing hard, clearly tired, and notices the captain looking at him, clearly worried. And one of the soldiers comes up to him and says that the commander of one of the main forces has received a signal. They were ordered to return the troops. After which, the commander turns back to Chris and grits his teeth, saying, damn it, and why? And a lot of allied knights standing nearby, watching as the enemy army, along with the captain, continue to go to the side, killing one by one on their way. And the soldiers are very surprised that the enemy is starting to leave. These soldiers stand in front of Chris and his company and think about why they are chasing them. A lot of them are confused and thinking about what happened, and they don't know what happened and what to do first. After that, Chris thinks to himself that it's true that all their generals are dead, and therefore now there is no one to lead the troops. He lowers his head and begins to think. Thinks what then? And Chris shouts to everyone that he is the commander of a 100-man army. So far, a lot of allied soldiers are paying attention to him. They look at him and are surprised that it's Chris. He keeps shouting that he has defeated the White Demon. While Digo and Daki both stand and watch, all covered in blood. One of the knights is surprised by this, calling him Saint Chris. Chris continues to shout that he is the head of the squad that destroyed the enemy partisans. Lind, who is watching everything, becomes uneasy as Chris keeps shouting that they should stand up now that they have come to their goal. He continues to shout, raising his weapons along with the other soldiers and talking about how who will be the victor in this battle and who will fight alongside Saint Chris. One of the enemy soldiers, all covered in blood, tries to strike with a spear, and he misses Chris, who manages to dodge. Chris looks directly at this spear that has managed to dodge and says what he sees. We look at the enemy, who clenches his teeth and attacks, covered in blood, thinking that the opponent's movement that he couldn't see before is now clearly visible. After that, Chris bends down a little and stabs with his spear, hitting him right on the neck and spraying his blood everywhere. He thinks he's changed quite well, while this knight screams in pain. This stuck spear in his neck sticks out while he screams and is approached by another enemy soldier trying to attack with his ball and Chris manages to dodge it. This soldier grits his teeth and wonders at this. Chris thinks to himself that now he picks up his dagger and throws it directly at the knight who tried to attack him. It hits him squarely in the head, and he drops his weapon and stands up. He thinks to himself that he won't make any mistakes, after which Chris notices one of the enemies running up to him and yelling at him to die. Chris notices this as he picks up his spear and sits on his lap. After that, one of the soldiers cuts off the arm of the enemy soldier who wanted to hit Chris. Chris looks behind these very surprised. After which, this black-haired allied soldier finishes off this knight by slitting his neck. After that, he turns to Chris and says that he is Mark of the 5th Infantry, and he joins their army. Chris stands up, covered in blood, and two more knights approach him. They say that he is on 6 infantry joins him, and another says that he is from 4 infantry squad and he is now with them. Also, tell all these soldiers to go ahead and destroy every single one of them. And they're all eager to fight. Chris stands next to Dig and they defend themselves while Chris attacks one of the knights. By lining them all up in a circle, Chris hits one of the enemies squarely in the face, causing him to scream and spill blood. Chris starts to look at the situation all day thinking it's great everyone is overflowing with determination to win. He stands in front of everyone and shouts to everyone to push harder and the enemy is almost defeated. Both Daniel are covered in blood as they look at Chris as he examines and shouts out a speech. Docky stands with two axes, covered in blood and looks at everything that is nearby, while an enemy corpse is lying on the floor. After that, Chris, along with his squad of many other knights, go forward, while a huge number of clouds of dust appear behind them, because of which only their silhouettes are visible, and there are many enemy corpses around. And Daniel shouts at Chris with a very happy smile as he looks at him. Chris stays and raises a penny at the top, and Daniel shouts that they won. So far, not everyone is watching the sunset and how empty the battlefield is, and all the soldiers behind them start to shout very much and rejoice in the victory. Very tired Chris looks at the sunsets and thinks to himself that they really won at last. Then his legs start to give out and he says yes. Chris falls and is caught. It was Gillen, and Chris notices it as Gillen pulls him away from her. He smiles and tells him that he's doing great and that it's a great job, and then switches off. Is someone entering the tent? A red-robed commander sitting on a chair listens as a knight wearing red armor walks in and says that the troops have just arrived. Abruptly, the enemy partisan commander enters the tent. He's covered in blood and walks forward while the commander holds out his hand, smiles, and tells him it's a good job. He asks what it feels like to come back looking at it. After that, he is very surprised at the state of the partisan commander. After that, he falls on his knees in front of the commander and says that he does not know the reason, after which the commander is surprised and says that what is the reason. And he begins to talk, while the commander stands in shock with surprise and begins to worry. He says that he is from the squad, including the commander himself. 
only 12 people survived, to which he is very surprised by this, they say that, how the hell did this happen? After that, the partisan commander grabs magpies by the head, clearly experiencing fear, says that it's all because of him. The latter is surprised and asks him, and for whom, and he begins to tell very much, panicking that the teenage soldier with blue hair is all his fault. Chris wakes up and starts to stand up, clutching his forehead with one hand. While Mark sits over him and he tells him where he is, Mark smiles at him as another soldier comes out of the tent and starts shouting about being told that the commander is awake. And Mark smilingly says that the commander, thank God, he came to his senses, and this is a barracks in the rear of the main forces. Chris wakes up and starts looking at Mark. He asks if the battle ended successfully, to which he is told that yes, the eight gate troops have retreated. This is their great victory. A pumpkin lands on Chris, and he is very much surprised by this. He starts stroking her, and Mark tells her at this point that this guy is very smart and never left his master's side for a second. Then Mark opens the tent gate and turns to Chris with a smile, telling him that they need to go now, because there's a place they need to go to. Chris and Mark go out and see two horses. Mark says that if they are uncomfortable, they can prepare a cart for him, and Chris says that it's not necessary. They both get on their horses and go ahead to Mark, and Chris says with a smile that he's a great rider, by the way. And Chris laughingly says that in his village he was called Chris the master of artificial horse riding. After which, Mark says that they are there, and Chris begins to look where they came from. They notice a huge number of platforms and a lot of soldiers standing next to the platform and the flag. Chris looks into this flag and sees a huge castle with a wall on it. It is blue and yellow in color, thinking that this is a drawing of a fortress wall. Then someone comes up on this platform with golden clothes, and he thinks that it looks like they have guests. He was a man with long hair and a beard, blue eyes, and a yellow cape. It was Count Ludwig. Behind him, Gilbert and the Earl's son are standing on the platform. Igrav begins to say that then he will allow the award ceremony for military merit to begin. All of Chris's troops are lined up in a row, and the Count tells them that the soldiers participating in the last battle rise to the position of commander and become a man and receive a reward in the world of five pieces of silver. This is Len Digo and Docky. Chris thinks to himself that this is pretty good, guys. After that, the captain comes out on the platform near a lot of allied knights. The game will tell you what is next for the 7th Infantry Squad. Does he ask you to come to the stands? Then the captain comes in. Many soldiers are watching the ceremony. None of the knights reads that for feats such as attacking enemy supply positions and blocking most of the supply routes. He is awarded the rank of knight and the official appointment to the position will take place in Central Shed. Chris looks at one of the captains, who is watching from the sidelines, and he is clearly displeased and says that this is insulting. The captain, who was standing near the count, lowered his head and pondered, while the person who counted this speech was very surprised at this. It's just that I'm in front of the count saying that someone who has tarnished the honor of knighthood has no right to receive this title again. And instead of being a knight, he would like to receive a reward in the form of gold. After that, Chris is very surprised together with the standing commander while he says that he is crazy. And the captain bows to the count and says that he wants to apologize for such harsh words. The result says that, if such is his desire. As long as the commander has closed his eyes, he says that. It awards a reward of five pieces of gold. Then all the soldiers around shout that it's their magnanimous count. After that, the following is called to the stands. And they ask Chris from the 100-man squad of the 7th Infantry to come up. Chris stands on the podium as the crowd cheers and cheers that he's here. And it is announced that Commander Chris is responsible for scouting the enemy's supply routes, capturing enemy carts, and helping in the battle with the White Demon. After which, many allied troops stood watching, raising their hands in the air and shouting that he was the hero of the battlefield. It is called the Saint of Chris. And while Chris listens to a speech about what it's like to unite the soldiers of an ally during a critical situation on the front line for command and leading to victory, the Count comes up to him and puts a medal in the shape of a tower on it. He says that he is awarded the Order of Military Merit. After that, they tell him that this is a great job of soldiers. And Chris is surprised to say that the commander of the 100-man force, Chris, is thanking them. The Count looks at the world of the show with a smile and says, does he accidentally want to go even higher? Chris asks him in surprise, which is why he thinks to himself that this Count is very frank. She looks at Chris and tells him to tell her what he wants. Chris looks at the Count and thinks this is his chance. He smiles and thinks to himself that he didn't fight all this time just to remain the commander of a 100-man force. All this to make this Count think that he would let this opportunity slip, and he was very much mistaken. He watches as many soldiers in the game nod your name and raise their hands in the air, saying that it will move on. Chris then stands in front of the Count as the wind blows through them. And Chris asks him if he'll let him become a knight. Chris smiles and looks at the Earl as the wind blows over them. He says that he will allow Wu Lai to become his knight. 
After which, both captains were very surprised by these words and all those who were standing next to him just stand up in shock, opening their mouths. At this point, the Count's son is very dissatisfied with what was said. They say that how dare he, while Gillen smiles at it all, and a lot of soldiers behind the bleachers are shouting that Night Chris is Night Chris. They support this idea by playing stand-up and watching it all, thinking what it means is what it's going for. Then he says, out loud, that it's not bad. And while Chris is standing there, the Count says that given the right of his majesty, Soldier Chris of the 7th Infantry Squad is appointed as an apprentice knight under the Count. Chris smiles as all the soldiers shout that he's become a knight, and he starts looking around and sees Gillen pointing behind the Count's son to get out. After which, Gillens is leaning on the carriage, standing while Chris approaches him, and he says congratulations on his promotion, and so far Chris says he didn't call him in just to say that. And Chris smiles at Gillen, and Gillen says he still has the same way of talking. Gillen becomes more serious and says that when Ty returns, he will find his group of hundreds. Gillen then leaves and says goodbye to Chris I while Chris I stares at his back. Chris tells him that if it's not urgent, then he won't be in a hurry and Gillen tells him to do what he knows and they'll see each other again. And late at night, near many tents, all the soldiers have undressed and are celebrating their victory. They hold up their drink mugs, shout and have fun, and cook food. And Chris is sitting on one of the logs with the captain. Chris looks at him and tells him why he refused, while the captain silently looks ahead. The captain looks very surprisingly at the smaller one, after which they look at each other awkwardly, and the captain says that no matter how much they looked at him, he feels like a completely ordinary person, and Chris asks what is he talking about. The captain tells me what's going on with his illegitimate son, from that ruined knight family. Chris asks if the captain has had a drink, and the captain says that he hasn't touched any more alcohol. Then the captain leaned down a little, leaning on his feet, and began to tell Chris, who was sitting next to him, that he had decided to team up with the Count, which meant what he was going to do now. And Chris looks ahead and smiles, saying something he doesn't even know. Then he just looks at me in silence and turns to the captain. He says if he calls him sometime, he will come. And the captain looks at him in surprise. He smiles and turns away, saying that he is ready at any time. After which, Lind opened his mouth and was very surprised by the many buildings. While they are escorting with other soldiers, they go through a huge settlement and say that this is the city of Debit. One of the soldiers will come true next to Chris and Dima, and smiling, turning to them, they ask, is this really his first time here? And Lind says he hasn't left his village since he was born, while Chris grins. He puts his hand on Lind's shoulder and while Lind is smiling, he says he should stop telling everyone that he's a redneck. And Lind says it's coming from the person who was born next door to him. After that, Doki and Digo walk next to each other, they look around. And while Chris is scratching his head around the tents, one of the bald soldiers approaches him and asks the master, is there really a branch for housing apprentice knights a little further away? And Chris smiles as he makes his way to the tent, telling him that he doesn't have to worry, because he's happy here, too. He walks into the tent and thinks to himself that there's no reason for him to settle into the apprentice knight's private use tent right now. And it's probably only going to make the guys who look at him sideways out of envy even more furious. After that, he enters an empty tent with a table, chairs and a bed, near which there are many boxes. He thinks that he knew it, that the level is just right in a spacious private room without thinking that there was no particular reason for him to stay in the barracks. Then he lies down on his bed and says out loud that whatever it is, you need to rest first. After that, he wakes up and pulls himself up with his hands, saying that I will have a good rest and now I can go. He goes out into the street, goes straight to the gate, which is guarded by two soldiers. Then someone follows Chris around and calls him in. He turns around and notices that it was Daniel. Digo reaches out to Chris, says there's something he'd like to tell him and Chris looks at him and smiles. They say that let's talk a little later, he needs to go to a place. To which Digo agrees, smiling back. Chris then goes to the exit and the soldier asks him where he's going. He smiles back at him and tells him that he wants to go out into the city for a while. He passes through the gate and thinks to himself that, of course, he also gets the status of a knight's disciple for the sake of freedom. He walks straight through the city near a lot of shops, thinking about what he needs faster than he thought, and it's only five minutes from the barracks to here. This one may be a small market, but it's still not bad. He goes to one of the drugstores, with a sign in the form of a flask and a cross in it. Entering it, he notices a lot of shelves with different things and a seller sitting on the stairs. And Chris thinks to himself that it's been a long time since he smelled herbs so strongly. And a middle-aged man sitting on the stairs with short hair turns around and asks him if he's running errands. To which, while Chris examines the product, he replies that if he has a medicinal herb called White Finger. This man is surprised and asks, which finger? Chris tells him that this long, finger-like grass grows in places where there is little moisture and little sunlight. To which the man says that he thinks he has seen one. 
he recalls that only after 15 years they will recognize the importance of grass and white finger, and it is the main ingredient in order to develop their abilities. Perceiving how after eating it, the man becomes much stronger, so Chris asks the shop owner if he would be willing to make a deal with him. After that, this salesman comes up to him, waving his hands and says that what kind of deal he wants to make because he sees that he is a soldier. And Chris stretches out one finger and says that the deal is for one year for one white finger root, one copper coin. After that, the shopkeeper turns away from him and thinks that one copper coin somehow. And Chris adds, interrupting him, that after one month of their agreement, he will pay two copper coins each. And the shop owner waves his hand, turning away, saying that he is not ready to take on such a job even for two coins. To which Chris says that what about five copper coins? And the owner of the shop takes Chris by the hands, kneeling in front of him and says that for his sake he will start collecting grass tomorrow. After that, Chris notices with the owner that someone is coming out of the stairwell and says that let's stop at four coins. To which the owner says that the buyer said that he would give five. It's a woman dressed in green. She says doesn't he know what long-term deals are? First, you need to think not about money, but about trust. To which the owner raises his hand and says that this is it, as clearly dissatisfied. After that, Chris puts four copper coins in the owner's hands, says that okay, let it be four. While the owner says that then he asks to take a fee from them. Chris gets out and continues walking through the streets of the city, thinking to himself that this way they will get grass on his finger. What do you think is left now? There is a crescent moon on the street. Chris and Digo walk through the forest as the moon shines down on them. Chris turns to him and asks him what he wanted to talk about. Digo then asks Chris what his goal is. Chris waves his hand and says that the goal is to quickly return to the barracks and go to bed. While Digo listens carefully to his words, but make a serious face and says let's not joke around, what does he want to achieve? Whereupon Chris pauses and stops. Does he say that he wants to reach the top? Digo looks at him and says does he really mean to become an aristocrat? To which Chris turns to him and holds up a finger, telling him that he wants to get even taller. Digo is very surprised by this, after which he sits down on one knee and says that he is absolutely not a very pathetic person. Chris is shocked and very surprised by what he sees while Digo is on his knees and says that, however, he has always told himself that he really wants to be useful. Chris asks him what he's doing and tells him to get up. After that, Daniel continues to sit on his knees and, with his head down and eyes closed, shouts that there is no knight or anyone else, but thanks to the fact that he has met the person he wants to follow all his life, he wants to take an oath. Digo keeps shouting at the floor that if he lets you, he wants to protect him and be by your side for the rest of his life. After which, Chris was very surprised by his words as he looked at him. He walks over to him and puts his hand on Digo's shoulder, and while the moonlight illuminates the entire forest, Chris and Digo's silhouettes sparkle in the darkness. He says that he accepts his oath and appoints him as his first knight. Chris is standing on a hill next to an empty tree. Watch as many soldiers train with wooden swords. The management of this military camp is going better than he thought, and besides, it's pretty big in its scale. After that, he looks at how many soldiers are running on horses, because there are training units of cavalrymen. And he had heard that Digo had been taken there to see if everything was going to be alright. And Chris is leaning on a tree, looking at everything that is happening, smiling, saying that he has a place that interests him more than anything else. He goes into a warehouse with lots of boxes and herbs. Speaking of that, the medicinal warehouse located in the barracks. And now you cannot think about going for herbs. He stands while the sun is shining on his back and thinks about how there is one thing but, since he is an apprentice knight, he can't use this warehouse, and you need to get permission from the manager. Chris turns his eyes around until someone comes up to him and tells him that he seems to have plenty of free time. After that, a grey-haired man with a black mustache introduces himself as the head of the military camp, and Chris turns around to approach him directly and say that he is the apprentice knight Chris. After that, the camp leader passes by and looks at Chris for a while, telling him to follow him and have a conversation with him, while Chris thinks about whether he can't be convinced. Then, in the room, Chris sits down at the table with the boss while a candle shines in the middle of the table, and he says that he will speak directly to the point. He looks at Chris, says he's not going to keep his troops idle. He will listen to him while he tells him that it doesn't matter to him who he really is, the holy hero of the battlefield or even the illegitimate son of the Count. You mean my saying to myself that there were some really strange rumors about him? And the boss, putting one hand and turning sideways, says that if he becomes a knight apprentice, he can leave here, finding a knight for himself to follow. And yet, if he doesn't like this situation, he wants to stay here. Whereupon Chris asks, then what? And the boss with the glowing eyes tells him to give what he is worth. And Chris says with a serious face that if he gives him a centurion of cavalry, he will show everything. To which the boss lowers his head, taking it with his hand and directly on the table, and asks how old is he 14. To which Chris leans on a chair and says that when winter comes, he will become an adult. 
to which the chief slams his fist on the table and, standing up, points a finger at Chris, starts shouting that he should listen here and never trust in his soldiers to some unknown puppy like him. And since he's here, he'll follow the rules of this place and prove his worth in a one-on-one -on -one fight. To which Chris, looking at the boss, is emotionless, says he picked it up, and then he asks for three opponents instead of one, thinking it will be enough. After that, the boss, listening to this, is very angry and says that what three of them he needs. He continues to yell at Chris, saying that he is really going to fight three of his soldiers alone, because one is enough for him. After all, this duel will take place tomorrow at noon on the training field. And will he have any questions? That Chris closes his eyes and says no way. The sun is shining while clouds are flying everywhere. Lin stands next to Chris as he picks up the spear and looks at it. Lin says did he really say that? Doesn't he think he got himself in trouble? And Chris says that once he wins the duel, everything will be resolved. And Chris is told that his opponent is Taylor. It is said that he is very famous as long as he stands in the rack with the ball. And he had heard that he had never lost in a one-on-one -on -one match. What it says when looking at Lind is that, however, he has no experience fighting on a real battlefield. To which Lin says that yes, this is true, but still he won 10 duels, he was even called the Invincible Lind. To which Chris takes a stance, just like he says he's not really interested. And Chris notices from behind him as the system sends him that the spear proficiency is 32. He thinks to himself that he's not worried about the fight. He is more concerned about the number of skill points. She lowers her eyes and thinks to herself, what's next? 32 they no longer increased. And the points that he earned in a real battle are still not enough. He looks up and is very surprised. Then Lind looks up with Chris' eye and he says it's snowing. Speaking of which, here comes winter. Chris stands in the arena against the very banner of the knight who took up a stance, drawing his wooden sword. So far, a lot of soldiers are raising their hands and rejoicing in the duel. One of the guys with the brown hair mustache smiles and says that Mr. Chris, the apprentice knights, he will not spare. To which Chris appoints her spear and says that this is what he wanted. At this point, the nearby soldiers turn around and say that they are betting three copper coins on Chris' opponent. Then a lot of soldiers watching the fight raise their hands and shout that they are two. And one of the soldiers stands there, watching, and says, isn't there a big difference in their physique? Because this guy won't even be an opponent. And a soldier with a short haircut standing in front smiles and says that it doesn't matter if they call him a saint or not. In this battle, he can't beat the invincible Taylor. Lind is with Dig, watching the fight while Digo talks about what Lind thinks. And Lind replies that he thinks it will all be over very quickly. While one of the soldiers standing nearby is clearly worried and tells him to stop and cancel his bet on Chris, because he is betting on Taylor. After that, Chris examines Taylor, thinking that he is similar in build to Dig. Looking at the pose and saying that he is right-handed, and from the weapon he has only a sword. After that, he thinks about what he will see, because do the rumors tell the truth? And Chris suddenly lowers his head, noticing that he's looking down at his leg and thinking about how the snow that fell yesterday has already melted and the ground is a little icy. After that, the camp commander shouts to everyone that the winner will be the one who deprives the enemy of weapons or forces him to accept his defeat. Then the boss shouts for everyone to start. At this point, Taylor runs straight at Chris, telling him that he will step on the first master. Chris readies himself for an attack and then manages to dodge it while Taylor tries to hit him with his ball and misses. He twists his sword, and Taylor lands another punch, which Chris defends by pulling his weapon back. Taylor continues to attack Chris, landing a straight punch while Chris blocked him with his spear. He smiles as he looks at Chris and says that he thinks he can dodge his attacks. And while Chris is defending himself, he thinks he's making too much noise. Then Chris notices, while Taylor was punching, that his neck is now exposed. He manages to land an attack, but successfully blocks it, looking at his spear and being surprised. Chris then steps back while the one who deflected the attack gets back into position. And Chris thinks to himself that he's only as fast as a knight apprentice. China Lore points his sword forward as Chris moves away from him. He pulls out his weapon and runs with a smile straight at Chris, who retreats. Speaking of which, if he only fights using the standard method, he won't be able to win. After that, Taylor slips on the sliding ice. He loses his balance, and that's when Chris attacks him. He manages to hit the man's arm, and he throws out his weapon, after which he trips his foot, and the man falls completely. Taylor lands on the ground, gritting her teeth. He glares at Chris and notices that Chris is already pointing his gun directly at him. After that, it is discussed that Chris won, and he looks directly at this knight and says that many changes can happen in battle. After that, Chris goes through the head of the game. What if he can use the medicine warehouse a little? After that, everyone in the crowd starts shouting and howling that their money has disappeared and the boss, closing his eyes, clearly feels bad, says that he can't. Danny smiles at the onlookers as Lin takes in the scene, and he says that's what you'd expect from their commander. After which, Lin sees Chris leave. He calls Chris over while he's still walking. 
After that, Chris is already in the warehouse and sorting through a lot of herbs, thinking to himself that all the herbs he needs are there and this is great. The preparation is finished, and one of the soldiers looks at it and says they were going to throw it all away. After which Chris tells this soldier until he is very surprised that no, from this day on, he brings these herbs to him. The result agrees with him, saying that he listens, and Chris built a tub in a huge barrel. He looks at her and says that it looks like the Baron didn't even skimp on a bath here. He looks directly at the water and sees a lot of herbs, thinking about how he added white water and those herbs that he just took out to get a full-fledged cleansing water. And even the teacher didn't know this, and the fact that it can transform the body of an ordinary person into one that is able to perceive internal energy. After that, Chris undresses and sits in the tub, thinking that, of course, this whole procedure will take a year. He sinks deeper and begins to think. He remembers fighting against Taylor. Speaking of which, no matter how good the basic skills were, he blocked more than two of his spear attacks. Remembering how Taylor blocked everything and Chris thinks about how he certainly didn't want to use evasive tactics. However, he grabs the bathroom and thinks that he's still too weak and this isn't the time to sit back. He must continue to improve his skills, after which he gets up and says he needs a mentor. An unusual animal of yellow color fits behind the rabbit and it says that Weiss is a mysterious force, and the difference between those who had it and those who didn't was clear. In front of a rabbit is a huge tiger, and people have metaphorically expressed this difference, in the form of a tiger-rabbit battle. Then he remembers a very strong soldier, all in all, scarred, saying that there was still a single movie in the world that could handle a tiger. And he remembers a gray-haired man with a beard and a scar near his eye, wearing glasses, as he drinks something from a cup, raising it to his mouth. It is said that this was his mentor, who taught his left-handed at that time martial art. His name was Tekel, and Chris gets up from the bed, very indignant and grabs his hands in his hair. He says he doesn't know where the hell he is now, because he's been looking for him for over a month, but he hasn't found a single trace. But his hands are clenched into fists, and while Pumpkin eats from his bowl, he says that I remember that before meeting him, he was endaved. After that, Chris grabs one head by the forehead and clearly angry says that you need to strain your memory, because he might have missed something and who would have thought that he went back in time, after which he touches his finger and says that for sure. He says he had a daughter. Then, on a dark night, he comes to one of the houses. It was an inn at the crossroads. Chris enters it and sees many soldiers sitting at the same table, discussing something, while the bartender wipes something with a white cloth. Chris sat down at the table with his group. Next to each of them are mugs of drinks, and while Docky drinks a mug, Lynn says it's been a long time since they've been out. And Docky puts down the mug, says that it is tasteless, clearly dissatisfied. And while Lynn tries it, Chris looks at the dog with a smile and says that really he can now talk in whole sentences. To which Lynn says that he helps him and Docky says that Lynn is his teacher. And Chris looks around, thinking to himself that he's spotted several people, one of whom might be the teacher's daughter. It will look like all the girls working nearby, one of them with green hair, standing near flowers, and two washing a plate with short red hair. They say that one girl is from a flower shop, and two girls are from a dish shop. After which, he watches a girl approach the drunken soldiers, along with a piece of paper on the blackboard, and Chris thinks that the last person he saw was Ellis, who works at this inn. After that, she comes up to them and says that is Chris really here again and does he need it as usual. Then Chris looks at her again and shows her four fingers. They say it's for four people today. He looks at her in turn, watching all the guests, and he thinks to himself that the teacher's daughter had beautiful eyes, so the probability that it was her is not so high trying to see her blue eyes. And Docky at this point says that, no matter how you look at it, it's not delicious. And Chris thinks to himself that his build and gait are almost identical to Diggs, no matter how you look at it. It's a pity that such a beauty is dying out in this inn. After which, clearly angry, Ellis looks at the dog and says that really, if he complains about food, he will fly out of here, if he doesn't like it so much, then he should shut up. And Chris is clearly uncomfortable as he thinks about how this explosive character is definitely not her. Then Chris hears the inn door is open. He turns around to see who it is. He sees a man walk in, wearing a cape and covered in dirt. That he's smiling and thinking that it looks like he came earlier. He looks at his former teacher and how young he looks with a black beard or the same scar near his eye. Then the woman at the bar asks him with a serious face that he needs food or a place to sleep. And the teacher comes up to Chris and says that he needs both. Then one of the soldiers grabs Alice's hand, smiling, and asks her if she would like to spend the night with him. She tells him that even if he gives them a cartload of gold coins, she will still refuse, and he is a jerk. Chris's teacher is watching all of this. I am one of the soldiers sitting next to me, when sat down on the table and says that, as expected, she is very hot. His soldier, who was grabbing Alice's arm, gets angry and grabs her by the clothes, bringing her to him and telling her that she is a damn girl. Does she have a boyfriend? She is very surprised by this and grabs his hand. They say that what is he doing? 
did he want to die and let him let her go. Then they drop their plates and dishes, and this soldier tells her why she is so reluctant. Then Chris stands up, closing his eyes, thinking about how bad things are. And he notices something, he watches the teacher appear right behind the soldier's back while he's pissed but barely says anything to the shameless wench and whether she knows who he is. After that, the teacher grabs him by the head, and he draws attention to him, saying that he is creating, and let him get his paws on the animal. After that, the teacher takes and lowers his head with his hand, landing directly on the floor, hitting with all your strength. After which, he clearly gets angry as he looks at this drunken soldier and shouts that he will make it so that he can't talk anymore. And Chris, watching this, is very surprised by what he sees and thinks that it seems that he is really on edge. And why is that? Because he's not the kind of person who would give himself up to emotions in such a situation. Then Reese takes the man. She is clearly perplexed and asks the guest to stop. Chris comes up to them and watches, and then it hits him and he says, what? Do you really think that she is the mentor's daughter? After that, two soldiers sitting nearby get up from the table and shout to the mentor that he is a freak. And Chris calls Digo over and stands right in front of these soldiers while they ask him who the hell he is, and let him get out of the way. Ellis is clearly worried about spilling out, says that the mentor should stop, and all the problems in the tavern will solve by themselves, while he takes something out of his coat. Then Chris comes over and sees him pull out a gun. They say that it is better not to pull out what is under his clothes. After that, the mentor mirrors Chris with his glasses, turning to him and asking if they will fight. And he says if he takes one more step, he'll tear it to pieces. To which Chris smiles and says that there seems to have been a misunderstanding his name is Chris and he is a knight apprentice. These drunken soldiers standing near Digo recognize Chris apprentice knight and become very worried. They look at Digo and say that then this man, and he tells them that he is the commander of the century his name is Digo. After which the soldiers say oh my god, they start to apologize and forgive them, and they didn't understand right away as he was in civilian uniform. And Chris, standing next to his mentor, who sits on his knees and says that the city that is under the control of the count of this territory with strict military rules. And so, if anyone dies in this inn. While Ellis watches what happens, and Digo watches as the two soldiers standing next to him get down on their knees and apologize. And the mission continues to say that Ellis and the owner of the establishment will take responsibility for this. After that, the mentor gets stuck. Ellis walks up to him and slaps him on the back, smiling and telling him that she owes him a favor now. While Chris sighs, as he leaves, he says that he will come back next time, opening the doors. Chris is watching this and Ellis is looking at him and says he's made such a mess and just walks away. Chris looks at Ellis and says that the man will come back, and she says does he really know him? And one of the girls with blonde hair and makeup comes up to Chris and smiles and says, Oh my god, has the master arrived and is he here? And Chris thinks to himself at this point that he's so tired of all the weird rumors that are going around about him and it's already four. After that, he can barely stand behind Chris and grins mischievously as he listens to this girl offering to ask him if he has time. While Ellis says that Chris is really so popular, he replies that he is a little busy right now and needs a little later. While the girl looks at him in surprise and puts a finger to her lips, he tells her how much it costs to spend the night here. Elisa says that he is really going to stay here for the night and get three copper coins in one night. And the girl standing next to him says that really he will stay here, because Mr. Chris should not do this, let them go to their mansion, which is located in this area, and this is better than such a nondescript place. Isn't that right? Ellie, listening to this, is very indignant and asks, how is this so? She gets angry by looking at her and saying who she is. And one of the customers stretches out his hands to this girl, smiling and saying that this girl is the daughter of Mr. Zarens. Then drunk Digo and drunk Lynn smile and point at her. They say that who is this and is it really some aristocrat? And Lynn says no, if you were an aristocrat, he'd have a last name with a last name like this he's never heard of. Then Chris puts his hand on his head and closes his eyes. While this girl shyly listens to Daniel and Lynn talk about how then since she's not an aristocrat, how dare she look down on the knight apprentice commander. What do they think? That this is what they are talking about, and do they understand that the position given to the counts themselves is considered a joke? After that, Docky stands up with the cups and shouts that he doesn't respect our commander, which makes him very angry. As Chris tries to stop him, reach out to him, and Alice starts to smile from beside him. Chris tells him to calm down while everyone else is watching the situation. Chris then sighs as it's Madam and the guy who are leaving, and he's told to keep it up with Docky and the man next to him says they'd better go, while Chris says enough is enough they're crazy. And how much the hell did they drink? Then on a clear day, Chris is sitting over a cup of coffee while Ellis is at his side, and they watch the mentor sitting with a mug. Chris takes the cup and drinks it while Ellis says he was unpleasant at first, but always quiet, and she doesn't know what happened to him that day. And Chris watches as Ellis wipes the dishes and asks if, by the way, she missed her father, to which she replies that how could she be bored. 
However, father didn't make any effort to find her, if he wanted to see her, he would come himself. After which, while Ellis is washing up, Chris asks if she thinks he's secretly watching her. To which Ellis says what nonsense he is saying, if he had come, he would have done it properly, because her father will not just spy on her. After which Chris stands up, Ellis notices it while he says what then. Chris comes up with a cup of coffee to his mentor, smiling, says that he asks for forgiveness and if he can have a cup of coffee with him. Then they sit down next to each other and Chris says it's good tea, isn't it? And the mentor replies, which is true, while Chris thinks about how unsociable he was before. They are sitting across from each other and Chris is smiling, asking if he really came from the center. And he is surprised and asks, how did he know? And while the mentor looks at his bag, Chris says that he saw that this method of binding a leather belt on the belt is used by aristocrats from the center. And he tells me that he got it as a gift when he left. A little burden some, of course. The mentor takes a cup of coffee and brings it to his face. Chris tells me what business he's here for, and he says that this is his hometown. Then he looks at Ellis and Chris watches. They keep an eye on Ellis, and Chris asks about his family until he starts choking and asks what. Chris looks away, smiling and saying that, in his opinion, he is filled with a deep sense of concern and concern for the lovers, they have too big an age difference, then maybe she is his daughter. And the mentor says that he is very observant. Chris then calls Ellis over. About the mentor at this moment, he is very worried and shouts about what he is doing. Ellis comes up to them and asks why he called her, and he gets up from the table and pushes back his chair. Speaking of which, this gentleman has something to say to her. Then the mentor is very worried, lowering his head and says that he will go and have things to do, while Ellis looks at it all with obvious incomprehension. Chris comes out of the inn, watching and smiling as Ellis shouts out what's going on. Chris sat across from Tackwill, watching him intently as Tackwill sipped his coffee. Chris asked him to teach him the art of weapons, and Tackwill asked him the art of weapons. He looked directly at Chris, then went on to say that he was an apprentice knight, but the person he would be learning from wasn't there. Tackwill asked what Chris meant by that. Chris drank a cup of coffee and then said exactly what he said, even though Count Ludwig granted him the status of an apprentice knight. But he didn't appoint a knight to accompany him. Chris reflected that of course, he didn't accept the offer to be an apprentice to some knight. Therefore, what he needs is not just the art of using weapons, learned from an ordinary knight, he wants to master the magic power that can hold an entire continent in his hands. Tackwill, holding a glass of hot coffee in his hands, thought for a moment, and then said that it was not difficult to do this, besides, he owed Chris a favor. Tackwill looked at Chris carefully, then said that he still wondered how Chris knew about him. Chris calmly looked towards Tekiel and then thought that if he tried to slyly evade the question, he would probably arouse suspicion. So it was worth giving out the most precious name he knew, and then Chris asked that by any chance Tekel had not heard of the illegitimate son of the Lord Count. Tackwell said that if Chris was somehow connected to him, Chris replied that he had been told that a knight who had been discharged from the Royal Guard had arrived in Lord Ludwig's county from the circus center. Chris closed his eyes and then put his hand over his heart and said that this was why he had the opportunity to be trained by this very member of the Royal Guard. He couldn't believe that this man would turn out to be the father of his friend, who, for him, is like a real brother. Tackwell thought for a moment, then said it was probably fate. He drank a cup of coffee and then said that, however, he had no experience in teaching anyone. Chris smiled and then suggested that they fight. Chris, holding a stick in his hands, stood in front of Tackile. Chris took up a stance with his stick outstretched. Tackwell looked at Chris carefully, then said that his morale seemed to be on high. Tackwell pushed himself off the ground and added that then. He frowned at Chris and then said they would dance. Tackwell took off. He moved closer to Chris almost immediately. Chris swung his stick in front of him with great force, sending up a large column of dust. But Tackwell was too fast, and he was immediately behind Chris. Chris started to turn around, startled and then Tackwell hit Chris's stick with unimaginable force. Chris flew out of the way at high speed. He held onto the ground, trying not to get too far away. Tackwell looked at Chris blankly and then said that maybe all he had was self-confidence. Chris looked carefully in front of him, then thought that Tickle's amazing speed made it hard to dodge him like that. Chris watched as Tackwell immediately rushed towards him, wondering if he was coming. Tackwell glared at Chris and threw a huge number of punches. Chris dodged with difficulty, and then, looking at Tequila who was attacking him, he thought that his attack consisted of three sticks. Chris desperately tried to defend against all the attacks. Tackwell started to push Chris away, and Chris wondered if he knew, too. And then Chris furiously lashed out, swinging his stick as he pondered that he shouldn't show off his skills. Tackwell stared ahead, puzzled, and wondered what else he needed to show. Chris managed to split the stick and attack Tequila. Chris hit the floor with his stick, and Tackwell was standing a few meters in front of him. Tackwell looked at Chris and asked him what he had just repeated after him. Chris calmly replied that Tackwell had seen it all for himself, it was a possibility. Tackwell glanced at Chris, then smiled and said it was interesting. 
Chris glared at Taquilla, a couple of bruises on his face. After a while, Chris stared down at the stick that was right next to his face. Taquil pointed his stick and glared at Chris, who was sitting on the ground. Chris looked at Tequila with a pained expression and then asked if they could do it again. Taquil smiled, then he held out his hand to Chris and asked him what he really wanted to learn. Chris got to his feet, then looked at Taquila and asked him if he hadn't already said that at the beginning, that he wanted to learn from him. Taquil took Chris by the shoulders and then told him that he didn't have enough strength. And then Taquil started walking away from Chris and added that they would see each other in three days. Chris fell to the ground, closing his eyes, and then said how hard it was. Chris recalled the fight with Tequila and reflected that he had about 12 chances to hit him, but he couldn't even touch his collar at all. Chris stared at the front in silence, he was thinking about why this happened, he had defeated an eight-gate knight on the battlefield. They were part of a well-trained elite force, but even so, he still lost, maybe it was because their fight wasn't serious. Behind Chris was an elderly commander, and Chris kept thinking that no, this wasn't an excuse for him to fight at full strength, had he overestimated himself and their difference in strength was so great. The commander frowned as he stood behind Chris, and then he said that even though Chris is a knight disciple, he is also a person of Lord Ludwig's county, which means he can't go anywhere and get beaten up if he doesn't have a knight to teach him, he can always come to him. Chris smiled, and then replied to the commander not to worry, it was just sparring. The commander turned around in a puzzled manner and asked sparring again. Chris turned around, his right cheek and eye were swollen he said he was very tired can he go. Chris started to leave, and the commander said sure. The commander, looking at the departing soldier, said that they beat him, of course, well. It was late at night. The girl sat across from Taquile with her hands folded, and then said that it was somehow awkward for her to call him father, whether it was possible for her to call him just Taquile. Taquile replied that it was more convenient for her. The girl looked at Taquila carefully and then said that then they would continue the conversation. She asked why he left her with her mother. Taquil closed his eyes, then thought hard. He replied that he did not know that this would happen, he did not intend to move up the career ladder. Taquil, looking at the sad girl, continued to say that he thinks he just wanted to show off his abilities, so he spent all 20 years on the run, in fact, he wanted a completely different life, this is not what he really wanted. The girl frowned at Tequila and then asked what about her birth mother. Taquil's face paled, and then he said something. His words brought tears to the girl's eyes. Taquil was sitting in front of her, frustrated. Then he lowered his head and apologized. The girl grabbed his hands. Taquil looked at her, puzzled, and then the girl smiled and said it was all right. She wiped her eyes, which were filled with tears, and then asked what Taquil was going to do now. Taquil asked the girl if there was anything Chris had told her. He asked her to teach him the art of weapons. Suddenly, the girl jumped up to Taquila with a smile and then happily asked him to teach her too. Taquila looked at the girl with a puzzled expression and then asked what she was talking about. The girl leaning on the table with a frown said that since childhood she wanted to become a knight, but due to the fact that her foster mother did not like fights, she could not choose the path that she wanted. In fact, she does not know how to cook, and working in a tractor is not suitable for her at all. Just let when Tikal doesn't tell him that he can't train her because she's a girl, Tikal says that he agrees. We are being transported to the forest. Chris is standing next to the girl, weights hanging from his arms, he looks ahead in a puzzled way, and then asks that he will train in this. Taquil replies that Chris has too fragile a body to learn the arts of weapons, first they need to increase his stamina. The prize points an angry finger at the smiling girl, then asks why she's not wearing anything. The girl runs away with a disgruntled Chris, and then says that he knows that she is the daughter of Taquil. Chris and the girl were running forward, and Pumpkin was running with them. The girl looked at the pumpkin, and then asked if she liked to run with them, the pumpkin barked. The girl was running along with Chris, but she looked at him and then asked where he found this cute creature. Chris said threateningly that stop talking, let him run. Taquil looked at Chris as he held out his arms with weights, and Taquil said that there would be a stand immediately after the run. Chris held the stick over his head with all his strength, and Taquil said there would be pull-ups next. Chris, working out hard, thought that in his previous life training was not so difficult. Did he really go there because he was left-handed? Suddenly, Chris's fingers began to slide off the horizontal bar. Chris fell to the ground with a crash. I asked heavily. Chris frowned at Tequila and then asked if this training was necessary. He wanted to learn the skills that he needed as a knight. Taquil calmly replied that without mastering the basics, Chris wouldn't get any further, and he would only be able to learn the skills he said he would only be able to increase his stamina and muscle strength. Chris was lying on the ground looking down, his brow furrowed, and Taquil said that they would see each other in a week, let Chris eat well, rest and sleep, this is also part of the training. Chris was sitting in a barrel of various herbs, thinking that he needed to last until the end. After taking a bath in purified water using regenerating herbs, he would return to training. 
we are being rescheduled three days later. Tequil looks at the calm Chris, puzzled, and then asks that he has regained his strength in just three days. Tackwell continues to say that with his body, such a recovery rate is simply unrealistic. His body structure is unusual, Chris smiled, and then said that he just knows how to use medicinal herbs a little. The girl stopped, dust flying from under her feet. She gasped for breath. Then she looked ahead and asked if she was slower, and Tackwell said no. Looking at Chris running with weights and a pumpkin running next to him, Tackwell said that Chris was the one who got faster. Chris happily ran forward, a system message appeared in his head that experience points were increased, and he happily said artifact. He jumped up high and shouted that he had succeeded. We are taken to Chris, who is lying in a tent, his muscles have grown significantly. Lind holds a book in her hand and looks at Chris with a puzzled expression, and then they ask him what he's been doing lately, and Chris closes the book and looks at Lind. Lind upset said that he would get the book here, Chris looking at him thought that it would be good to train together with his comrades, but they are under the command of the old man's boss. Chris, sitting on the bed reading a book, asked if it was a pity for Linda to spend all her salary on books alone. Lind calmly replied that this was his only entertainment right now. On the bed, looking up at the ceiling, he said that the last time he participated in a meeting of soldiers, when he made a proposal to improve the current military system, the boss told him not to interfere. Lind, lying on the bed, continued to say that it feels like not he, not Digo, not Doki, not the commanders of 100-man squads. Suddenly Lind said if he could ask Chris something, Chris turned around, puzzled. Lind, lying on the bed, said that if everything went on like this, everything would be fine, there was nothing he could do in the army right now. Chris, listening carefully to these words, wondered what he had thought about it in his previous life, what would have happened if Lind had received a normal education and training since childhood. Chris closed his eyes, then said, well, that's what he was sure of. Chris glanced at Lind and then replied that the point is that if Lind wants to make a difference, there is no other choice but to move up, he just needs to be on the battlefield and stay alive. Lind got up from the bed and then put his hands on his waist and said that he thought it was the only way, he just complained to him because it was hard on his soul. And then Lind added that Chris is looking for the old man's boss, Chris looked at Lind with displeasure and then asked that he did not think that he should have said this earlier, but a higher person is calling him. Lind smiled and then waved his hand and said that let them try hard from now on. He said that Chris would be a little late, so he wouldn't get mad at him even more. The knight's disciple, Chris frowned and said that Lind was a lousy messenger. We are taken to the commander, who is holding his hand to his face, and Chris tells him that he heard the commander calling him. The commander pushes back his chair and tells Chris to sit down. They sit down together at the same table, and then the commander says that he will not beat around the bush, let Chris stop using the medicine warehouse. Chris looked at the commander in a puzzled way, and then asked why so suddenly, the commander replied that the amount of herbs that Chris had already spent was equal to the year-round amount. The missing herbs he had to fill up by spending money out of his own pocket, but this is already the limit. The commander took his hand away from his face, there was a large hand mark on his face, and then the commander said menacingly that yesterday he had already flown from his own wife. Chris looked at the commander in fright, then said my god, the commander replied that in general, he asks to understand him. Suddenly, Chris looked at the commander and wondered if he would use this moment properly. Chris abruptly got up from the table and slammed his hand on it, and then said that it was his mistake, he apologizes to the old man's boss. Chris looked menacingly at the commander, and then said that he would take charge, let the commander let him manage the medicine warehouse, in two months he would solve all the problems, the commander asked that he was sure that you can. Chris looked at the commander with a crazy smile, and then said that, of course, if the commander would allow three people to be taken into his wards. We're being taken to see Linda Digo and Doki. They deathly stand in front of Tequila and Chris, then Chris says that the fact is that in their troops they cannot receive training. Chris glanced at his friends then said that besides, he had heard that Tackwell had rejected the Count's request to be his soldier. How about becoming an instructor didn't he need to earn money to buy Ellis a beautiful horse? Tackwell calmly replied that it was fine. Chris looked at Tequila with a smile, and then Tequila said that he would accept them if they could withstand his training. Chris replied that then he asks for love and favor. We are being transported to the city. Chris walks down the street thinking that everything is fine. Those three from the troops he pulled out, now it remains to deal with the drug warehouse. He thinks that even if the four of them spend two months just doing what they want to collect herbs, they will still not fulfill the missing amount. And if you also take into account that they also need to continue training, it will be unrealistic at all. Chris walked down an empty street, and a small alley appeared in front of him. He glanced at it with a smile, and then thought about taking advantage of the city's shadow at times like this. There were two guys standing in the alley, and one of them asked Chris who else he was. Chris frowned and walked up to the guys, then said that he was a knight disciple named Chris, he came to make a deal, let them take him to their boss. One of the guys said with a malicious smile that well, Mr. Knight means, the other looked angrily at Chris and said that it was better to let him get lost while he was talking in a good way. 
Chris, looking at the guys menacingly asked that why they still do not know him, living in this area, as they have been organizing all this time. One of the guys swung his fist and shouted, you little puppy. Chris deftly dodged the blow. He clenched his fist and then thought that he hadn't fought in a long time. He smacked the guy in the face with all his might, knocking out a tooth. The guy started to fall to the ground, and Chris and the guy's friend looked at him with a puzzled expression. Chris, looking at the broken tooth, wondered what it was just now, he was giving more than he expected. A guy inside the building heard a noise from outside, he looked at the door with a puzzled expression and asked where he was from. He reached for the door handle and said he'd check. At the same time, Chris kicked the door of the building open. Chris went inside and then calmly asked that he was Murdoch's hunting dog. The guy looked ahead with a frown and asked who he was, Chris said, well, there's a smell, they didn't think to clean it up. And then Chris replied that he was a knight disciple named Chris, he came to make a deal. The guy, standing behind his comrades, said that since the morning he has been walking and getting caught, then added that his guys should deal with him. Chris smiled and took a stance, then said it was good, so the conversation would go faster. The bandits, looking angrily at Chris, took off. The bald bandit lunged forward with his dagger, but Chris deftly dodged. Then he slammed his fist into the guy's face with all his might. The bandit started to fall, and at that moment another one ran up and swung his foot at Chris, but Chris crouched down and dodged the blow. He glared at the bandit. The gunman was looking at Chris, startled. Then Chris swung his fist around and slammed it into the thug's face. Another bandit, seeing all this, fearfully holding his fists in front of his face and began to approach Chris from behind, the head of the bandits looking at this thought that who is he, one blow for each. Chris turned and kicked the gunman behind him. Before Chris could finish one, another one appeared behind him, swinging a club at Chris. Chris glared at him. Then he covered himself with his hand, and the thug who had hit Chris's arm with all his might saw his club break. He looked in front of him in fright, then asked in a trembling voice what it was like. Chris' t-shirt was torn and there was an iron armband underneath, Chris replied that he also had a gun. The head of the bandit stared ahead in fright as Chris destroyed his comrades one by one. The bandit leader clenched his teeth and looked menacingly in front of him, and then shouted that the damn idiots, they can't catch some sucker. Glova Banditov swung his hand, and then Chris kicked off the ground with great force. He stepped on the bandit leader's face at high speed, then jumped over him. The head of the bandits turned around in fright, and then said, that's a bastard. The bandit leader's face was marked by Chris' boots, and Chris swung his foot again. Then, with great force, he punched her in the nose of the bandit. The bandit coughed up blood, then he fell to the ground, unconscious. Chris slapped the gang leader on the cheek and shouted at him to get up. Chris looked at the head of the bandits who had woken up with a smile. Behind them all the bandits were kneeling with their hands raised. Chris asked what he should do when the head wakes up later than everyone else. Chris looked at the bandit leader's battered and frightened face, and then said that he had a job for him, he didn't need to collect anything complicated. Chris smiled, and then added that they'd get a decent payoff for it. We are taken to Chris's tent, where he puts on his military uniform, and then thinks that he has solved the problem with the drugstore. They carry us over to where Linda Digo and Docky are lying on the ground, they're tired and yelling at Chris, their clothes are dirty and their faces are covered in bruises, and he wonders what to do with them now. Chris smiles as he hears the screams that he's a jerk for killing them, someone saying in a shaky voice that he can't take it anymore. Chris, looking at the tired comrades, said that everyone did a great job, let them get up as soon as possible, they need to go somewhere, Lind frowns and replies that Chris is a fucking devil. We are transferred to the bathhouse, Chris's comrades sit in barrels and rest, and Chris looks at them and says that the herbs that are in the baths are equal to his monthly salary. Chris comes out of the bathhouse and sees a female employee in the hallway. He comes up to her with a smile and tells her that it must be hard for her to keep an eye on the bathroom every day. And then Chris thanks her and says that thanks to her, they enjoy using the baths. The employee replies with a smile that it's okay, it's her job. Chris takes out a bottle of purple liquid and says that he has prepared a small gift for her. What is in the bottle is called clean sleep. If you apply the contents every day before going to bed, the same will become cleaner and more gentle. The worker looks at the bottle puzzled and then says, God, thank you so much. The employee took the bottle in her hands, and then Chris asked her that by chance, she does not know the people who work in the mansion of aristocrats, answered that she knows them, and why Chris asks about it. Chris smiles, and then replies that one such bottle costs 30 silver coins, the employee is frightened to ask that she can use such an expensive thing. Chris, looking at her, replies that of course, but in return he asks her to tell him rumors from people working in an aristocratic mansion, then he will give her one bottle of pure sleep every month. Chris thought that the money earned from pure sleep turns into a reward for Murdoch, and the herbs received again turn into pure sleep, he built a cyclical system, now you can safely focus on training. Chris was lying on the bed, with a bag and his small bag on his desk. Lying on the bed with a smile, he said that he could just drop everything to hell and go to the merchants. Suddenly, some purple smoke appeared. 
he reached Chris, who was sleeping. After passing through the tent, Pumpkin startled Zagavkala. Chris woke up, rubbed his face, and asked why the pumpkin Razgavkal. Chris suddenly sat up next to the bed, startled, wondering what was going on, his head spinning. Chris gripped the table, then realized that he needed to take the antidote sooner, which was reserved for emergencies. Chris fumbled for his small bag, and then he grabbed her and looked at the pumpkin and told her not to smell anything and come out. Chris popped a pill into his mouth and then thought that this smell is similar to the aroma of sleeping pills, which contain marine blue. The smell is very sharp, so it was not made by a herbalist. Such a fragrance is used by robbers. Chris looked to the side and heard a dog barking. And then going out into the street I saw two people in black clothes approaching the pumpkin. One of them said that the dog was good, let it be a good dog and stop barking. The other replied that it was not a dog, but a wolf. Chris, looking at them, wondered what kind of guys they were. They went inside their barracks. Suddenly, a man in a black cape with a mask on his face turned around and shouted to his comrade from behind. The guy in the black cape spun around and threw the dagger. Chris dodged it with a frown and then wondered if they knew where his sleeping place was, so it must have been planned. Chris quickly approached the enemy. The man gave Chris a startled look, then realized that he was very fast. Chris punched the man in the stomach with great force and then thought that they should not hit each other in the legs. The man jumped back a couple of meters and Chris and Pumpkin took up a stance. The man, looking fearfully at his friend, asked if he was alright. The guy replied that it looks like he broke something for himself. Chris looked at them menacingly and said that they had the audacity to attack a knight disciple inside the Count's camp. If they didn't want to rot in prison, they should get out now. The two guys immediately ran away. Chris, looking in their direction, told Pumpkin that she smelled the smell, let her run after them. The guys in black capes were running away. One of them, looking at his friend, asked him how he had survived. He had to lie down for two days from such a large amount of the drug, and his friend replied that he knew. But first they had to go back and report everything. The boys reached their tents, then someone suddenly called out to them from the bushes. The boys turned around, puzzled, and saw Chris with a pumpkin. One of them asked how he got here. Chris looked at them with a crazy smile and then asked that there was a hideout for them. He clenched his fists and then told them to bring their boss over quickly. Chris folded his arms and stared at the two men in black capes. And then he said menacingly, looking at them, what they are worth, time is money they did not hear, quickly let them call. One of the men thought for a moment, then asked his companion what to do. Suddenly, a third man appeared and came out and asked what was going on here. The man in the cape looked at him in fright. Chris stared ahead, doing nothing. The man who came out had short red hair and glared at his companions, and Chris wondered if this was their boss. The boss looked at his subordinate. Then he slapped him hard across the face. Chris watched, puzzled, and then the boss hit the second man between the legs. He frowned at Chris, and then he said that their guys had caused him a bit of trouble. No offense, Chris said he wanted to ask why they were targeting him. The boss thought for a moment, and then replied that it was because of the clean sleep recipe. The boss turned around standing next to his guys and then said that if Chris' curiosity is satisfied, he can go. Chris looked at him and thought that look at him. And then Chris frowned and asked that the owner of the lion was an illegitimate child. The boss glared at Chris, and Chris wondered if he knew what he was going to do. And then Chris, looking at the head of Grozny, continued to say that behind him was Beck Dagger with a dagger. That's right. Behind Chris were several other thieves in black hoods with a dagger in their hands. Chris thought that at some point, he was surrounded. The chief of thieves glared at Chris, then asked him what he wanted. And then Chris told him to tell him who the owner of the lion was. The boss, standing behind his subordinates, said that he was responsible for the back danger lion. Chris took out a small bag and then thought that he didn't know if the man was telling the truth or not, but there was only one way to check. The boss stepped forward, glaring at the bag, and Chris tossed the bag at the feet of the thieves' heads, then told them to make a bet. Chris went on to say that there were 50 gold coins in the bag. What would he say to that? The head of thieves thought for a moment and then asked what Chris needed. Chris smiled and then said that he wanted all the back dugger members to serve under his leadership. The thief who was standing behind Chris looked at him in fright, then said that he was crazy. The head of the thieves glared at Chris, then laughed and asked what the bet was all about. Chris took out a dagger and said with a smile that they would fight on the same dagger. Love of Orov smiled, looking at Chris and asked that so he was from the same circles. Chris smilingly replied, and what is not allowed? A torch lit up. The head of thieves and Chris walked around him. And then Chris kicked off the ground and said what then? They began to offend around the torch. The speed was so great that they were almost invisible. Chris glared at the head of the thieves. The glove of Orova also looked at Chris. Suddenly Chris stumbled, stepping on a hole. The head of the thieves was approaching Chris from behind, and Chris was startled to think that there were holes in the ground, these cowardly types. Glove of Orov saw Chris's misfire and smiled maliciously. Chris stared ahead, startled. The head thief's dagger was coming towards Chris' face. Chris looked ahead, startled. And then, with lightning speed, he spun around. Glove of Orov looked ahead, 
puzzled, not understanding what was going on. And then Chris threw the dagger at the head of the thieves with great speed and force. The dagger hit him squarely in the leg, and the head of the thieves was taken aback by it. He gritted his teeth and then looked away. Chris looked towards the thieves' head with a smile, the system message throwing skill popped up in his head and he thought that his throwing skill had increased dramatically. Chris smiled and then said that it probably hurt him. Glove of Orof shouted loudly, which made them stand up, kill him now. The black-robed thieves immediately pounced on Chris, looking at them, Chris shouted at Pumpkin to stay close to him. Suddenly, someone came out and shouted enough. Chris, holding the thief by the scruff of the neck, smiled and said, Oh my god, here you are. Gillen stepped forward, looked at Chris, and said they hadn't seen each other for a long time. The head of the thieves looked at Gillen in fright, Gillen continued to tell Chris to come in, they would talk for a while. Gillen went into the tent, and then told the head to bring everything in order, the head replied in a frightened voice that she obeyed. Chris and Gillen entered the tent, and then Chris looked at Gillen and said that he looked more modest than he thought. Gillen was dressed in black clothes he looked at Chris and said he was long. They were standing at the end of a large room, and Chris said that he had a lot of things to do since arriving in town. Gillen said that by the way, he didn't say his name, but Chris already knows it, Chris smiled and said that he has connections. Gillen frowned at Chris and then asked the illegitimate child, Chris replied that it was a mistake. Gillen asked if it was true that Chris was being trained by a royal guardsman, and Chris wondered if he already knew. Chris calmly replied that it was true, the training was worth it, and then asked how Gillen knew about the pure dream. Gillen closed his eyes and replied that it was an errand from a merchant named Zarens, and that he had nothing to do with it. And then he added that whatever it was, he wishes her good luck guiding her to back danger. and Chris looked at Gillen with a puzzled expression and asked what. Gillen started to leave the tent, then smiled and said that Chris had won the bet, which he wasn't sure he could do. Chris glanced at Gillen's long hair, then laughed and said no. Gillen went outside, and then said to listen carefully, today, Chris becomes head of back danger. Gillen smiled and closed his eyes, saying that he would go. The short-haired guy who fought Chris got down on one knee and then said that his name was Fox, and from that day on, he was the second in command of the Beak Dager Guild. Chris, looking at Fox's frowning face, thought that it was obvious from his face that he clearly didn't want to admit it, and then Chris answered well and added that then he immediately had a job for him. Fox asked which one, Chris pointed, and then told Focus to bring a merchant named Chris here until tomorrow night. We are taken to Tequila, who is standing next to a smiling Chris and says that Mr. Student, he looks like you've been very busy lately. Chris looks at his teammates as they train, then asks, are the guys doing well? And Tackle thinks about it. Digo Lind and Docky run with weights on their hands, sweating, and then Tackle says what Chris sees. And then Tackle looks surprised that they should go to the practice field. Tella takes the stick in her hand and looks at Chris carefully. And why Tackle throws a stick on the ground and says that Chris lost his weapon on the battlefield, what will you do? Chris gives Tequila a puzzled look, then says he'll pick up something else. Tackle steps on a stick, breaking it. And then looking carefully at Chris, he asks what if the situation doesn't allow it. Chris puts his hand to his chin and thinks. And then he points at himself and replies with a smile that he will use his own body as a weapon. Tikal smiles and then says that this is the correct answer. Basic training is over and they're moving on to Tejutsu for today. And then Chris tilts his head and says that then he will be happy. Tackle replies that this is an unusual reaction. Then he adds that usually when someone says you're going to learn Tejutsu, they're disappointed. And Chris smiles and says that if Tikal puts them in the same category as those who said that, they're upset. Tackle smiles, then thinks it's great. The non-invasion time that Lind had told him about in his previous life would last for two years from now on, even if the future might change a little, he had saved the extra time for himself. Chris, looking menacingly ahead, thinks that the money, wise, weapons, everything that he will need in a short time is already in his hands. Fox stirs the herb in a bowl. He looks at it sadly and thinks that he doesn't understand what Monsieur Gillen was thinking when he gave the position to this guy. Moreover, the medicine for improving the skin condition, up to such drugs in bulk so far, how good is the effect of this thing? Just for one bottle you will have to give as many as 30 silver coins. A guy in a black cape walks into the tent holding a man with blue hair and his eyes blindfolded, then the guy says they caught Fox, Fox tells them to take him to the basement. Chris rips off his blindfold and then starts screaming. He is on his knees in front of Fox, shouting that he is begging for his life and adding that he will do anything. Fox glares at him, then asks what's really going on. Chris replies in a shaky voice that anything, as long as they don't kill him. Fox, looking at Chris, says that in the future he should not go and blab to anyone about the night and Chris, Zarens replies that he understood. Chris slowly walks down the steps to the basement, Fox is on his knees asking what else is going on, Fox tells Chris to shut up for a while. Chris looks at his new teammates with a smile, then asks them how they're doing. Fox looks at Chris with displeasure, and then it is said that Chris said that the name Chris will never come out of his mouth, now you can let him go. 
Chris smiles then asks the truth and says that then you can. Fox took a deep breath and then thought that he knew that if this little guy let him go, then there would be problems later. Fox ordered his subordinates to untie Fox's hands. Chris happy started thanking saying, Thank you very much. Saren's well that untied the blindfold and then said that he would never forget your grace. Suddenly Chris told Chris to stop and Fox looked at him with a puzzled expression. And then Chris came right up to Chris and said that if he untied the blindfold and saw him, he would have to kill him. Zarens got very scared and started shaking. He put his hands behind his head. And then Chris calmly looked at him and said that it was his idea to attack the Knight Disciple in the barracks. Chris replied that it wasn't him. And then he added that all he'd been told to do was find a recipe for a clean night's sleep. And Chris had glared at Chris and then told him to cut out his tongue. Fox and his subordinate gave Chris a startled look. And then Chris sat down on a chair, the soldiers knocked Chris to the floor, he desperately started shouting that why are they suddenly doing this, he made a mistake in fact, he planned it all. Root raised his hand in the air, and Zarens continued to beg, begging for mercy. Chris stuck out his index finger, then Scarecrow looked menacingly ahead and told them to break one of his fingers. There was a crunch in the basement, and Chris screamed in pain. He was sitting on the ground with a broken finger, and then Chris told him that now let him be kind and answer his questions. Chris asked what name Chris should forget. Chris whispered Chris. Chris took a deep breath and closed his eyes, then said it looked like one finger wasn't enough. Chris begged for mercy, he begged for another chance. Chris said it would be his last attempt, and then asked him what name he should forget, but Chris didn't say anything. And then, sitting on the ground, he said he didn't know what he was talking about. Chris said that was great, he thought Chris had become a merchant for a reason. Chris approached the merchant and whispered in his ear that they were Bektajer, knight of the day once they saw him, their blade would reach his third daughter, who he was so proud of. Zarens was silent, sweat and tears streaming down his cheeks. Chris ordered Chris to be taken outside and released, and the soldiers said they were listening. Chris looked at Fox with a smile and told him to follow him, he wanted to give him something. Chris held out a roll of paper and then said that it was a recipe for pure sleep, let him study it carefully with his eyes, when the time came, he would teach him how to prepare it. Fox looked down at the package, puzzled, and then asked why Chris was giving it to him. Chris smiled as he looked at Fox, then said that the faint aroma of herbs coming from his body and dust on his fingertips, the soporific fragrance that was sprayed in his ward, was his special skill, Fox sniffed his clothes. Chris continued to say, looking at the puzzled Fox, that he was planning to increase the production of pure sleep and the guild just had a specialist. Chris closed his eyes and held his hand out in front of him, and Fox wondered what was right. Chris came out of the tent, and Fox looked at him and thought that Monsieur Gillen would not have put anyone in his position. We are transported to the city late at night. A girl runs into the room and shouts to her father that where he was all this time, she was waiting for him so much. A girl with long yellow hair smiles, clasps her hands and says that she has already decided on her chosen husband, the gentleman that she saw last time does not get out of her head. Her father, lying on the bed, covers himself with a blanket, and the girl continues to say that she thinks that no one will suit her except Lord Knight Disciple Chris. Her father shouts at her to stop. Zarens is lying on the bed in tears, and his daughter comes up to him and asks what is wrong with him. Her father shakes his voice and asks her to stop. 